Welcome everyone to the Irish Breakdown Podcast, the main source of Notre Dame content here at irishbreakdown.com. I am the director of recruiting at Irish Breakdown, Ryan Roberts, joined, of course, by the publisher of the site, Mr. Brian Driscoll. want to thank you all, of course, for joining us today. want to say before we begin, if you could like, subscribe, hit the notification bell, and share this podcast. We have a lot of extra shows now with uh, with Sean Steyer's new show, the I the IB Nation Sports Talk Show, as long with our daily show here every day at 1 o'clock Eastern Time. Don't want to make sure that you miss any of the hot news. Today we'll be talking a couple recruiting tidbits on today, but mostly we'll be getting into Lindy's and Athlon's rankings of the Notre Dame offensive positions going into the season. But of course, as people are well aware in the chat, we have to begin the show there was, uh, Brian, some some controversy over some comments recently. Well, actually, maybe I shouldn't say comments. Dennis Dodd kind of portrayed Marcus mm-hmm. Freeman a certain way very recently. And today, we had a interview that Marcus Freeman did recently that kind of dispelled how he was portrayed. So take us through some of these comments, Brian. And I know you have a lot of thoughts, and I know yes. people are really looking forward to it. I have a lot of thoughts on Dennis Dodd. Uh, first of all, I, I read the article before the Ohio State people kind of started getting all in their feelings about it, right? And that's just what Ohio State fans do. It's like for all the success you've had, you'd think they'd be a little less sensitive, but they're not. So, but that's beside the point. As I'm reading the article, I didn't even get to that part yet before I was annoyed. It was just a typical Dennis Dodd hackery. And, and Dennis Dodd is a straight clown. He's always been a straight clown. He's pretty much a crap writer anyway, but he's always had an axe to grind against Notre Dame. He's constantly having to backtrack this, backtrack that, go all the way back to comments he made about Don Treadway, uh, all the way back in Michigan State in 2010. He's a hack. He's someone who cares about hearing his name talked about as opposed to journalistic integrity. And it's people like him that is why you don't hear me call myself a journalist because I don't want to be associated with people like that. And it used to be where people like that were sort of like, you know, kind of on an island, I felt, right? And then, and then, like, you had these, like, clowns like Skip Bayless, but they were, like, the unique, like, weird, like, personalities that just cared more about their fame than they did about, like, doing the job credible. Now that's about all you see on a national stage. It's, like, it's clickbait. It's clickbait. Let's have some stupid argument where I say some outlandish thing, you know, that, that everyone's going to talk about because, you know, as long as I'm being talked about, that's a good thing. That's who Dennis Dodd has always been. He's a hack. And he's always had this, this anti-Notre Dame thing. He's always got to make these comments and, and, you know, trying to tear Notre Dame down. And even in this article, before you get to the Ohio State nonsense, Ryan, I just had you read that part <clears throat> that about the Dolly Duffy interaction. Did you read that? Yep. Like, yep what was the point it. of including that in the article? It, I, it was absurd, other than to have it to where some lady shited him, right? Like, this is my time. Like, I don't even know who this lady is. Nobody cares who this lady is, right? Like, what did that have to do with anything? And that's not no disrespect to Dolly Duffy, but like, what does she have to do with this article? Mm-hmm. She has nothing to do with this article. It just was, a, it was a little, and this is what he does. He'll write this thing where he talks about this thing and this nice thing and the other kind of thing. But then when you talk about his, you know, the, just the title, you know, hype train, like I just felt like that was disrespectful. And that's probably me reading into him knowing he's a hack and knowing how he uses things like this. And then, you know, that little part about, about Dolly, it's like, why why put that up there? So you can get some awkward segue just so you can kind of get that some lady talked down to Marcus Freeman. Like, you're a clown, right? And then he kind of dives into this whole, this academic thing. And this guy never had a nice thing to say about Brian Kelly until Brian Kelly's at LSU taking shots at Notre Dame. Then he wants to write, you know, all this nonsense. And then that led to me just destroying Brian Kelly on this very platform because that's who Dennis Dodd is. He's a hack. You know, he likes putting out stuff that's going to create emotion rather than telling a good story or reporting the news. And he had an attempt to really put portray Marcus Freeman and and the uniqueness of his of his ascendancy to this position. You have a 36 year old guy that has taken over at one of the most prestigious institutions in America. And you want to kind of start putting him into this quote. I love this one. Right. Free Freeman is still in a silo with those other gentlemen who became first time head coaches at the at at one of the biggest pressure cookers in sports. Jerry Faust, Bob Davey and Charlie Weiss. Oh, man. Right. I'm like, really, really? 
And then he says the new coach is repeating a lot of what previous coaches have said. This is right after talking about Jerry, Jerry Faust, Bob Davy, and Charlie Weiss. Mm-hmm. It, it just the whole thing was just a, a bunch of absolute, just typical Dennis Dodd hackery. And and you know, look, the the other problem I have too, Ryan, is I don't know why Notre Dame continues to allow this guy to be around. They don't have to look. They can choose who to credential, who not to credential. Right. And, and, and you want to credential him? Fine. Let him show up and, and be at interviews. But mm-hmm. why would they give him a one on one? I'm going to give I'm going to give a little bit of a benefit of the doubt to like, you know, to, to people at Notre Dame that are setting these things up, because a lot of them are somewhat still new. Sure. And you're know, like Notre Dame's current SID, Katie Lonergan, really respect Katie, like what she does. But she's only been here a couple of years and they had her first year was like the covid year and all that. She doesn't have the history of what some of these outlets are that that you and I might have history to, right? And then she's surrounded by a lot of other people who are new. So there's not like the the you know the the history of where like a John Heiser is going to know. Okay, here's the agenda that this guy's coming from, and that's part of the learning process. So this isn't a shot at Katie, but there's enough people at Notre Dame that this kind of thing needs to be said. Like, hey, look, this guy, you got to be careful with this guy. Like Coach Freeman needed to go into that interview knowing that this is who Dennis Dodd is. Or here's the thought: don't interview with Dennis Dodd. What, what, who cares what CBS Sports thinks? But that's what Notre Dame does, right? Like they'll not give the local media a whole lot of access, but then any chance ESPN wants to talk or CBS Sports or The Athletic, all these outlets that are are going to put him in awkward situations or misquote him or do whatever else. And they kind of did it to Brian Kelly, although the difficulty of the Brian Kelly tenure was he often gave them legitimate red meat to kind of <laughs> run with. It, it, it It's like, but you you got to know that. Right. You got to be you got to prepare him for that. That's kind of what you're supposed to do. And and clearly he he went into that interview thinking I can be honest and we can have a conversation and you're going to quote me correctly. The mistake that Marcus Freeman made was assuming that Dennis Dodd was either a professional. She's not B honest and had a, you know from an integrity standpoint to his job, which he doesn't and C that he has talent, which he doesn't. And so that's a bad trio for someone at a national outlet. And he mm-hmm. did what it was very like. If you'd have told me, hey, Dennis Dodd's got an article coming out about Notre Dame, I'd have, oh, great. Now, what's he going to say? Right? right. That's just who he is. He's an unprofessional, um, just absolute clown. There's really no other way to say it. And, and I, I'm, I'll own that, right? That's not like the most intellectual way to describe someone. But I mean, I, you got a better word? I, I, because the words that I have, I don't like to use on this, this platform, right? So, well, I'll, I'll say this, Brian. I mean, just for some context, I guess, of if people haven't seen what 100% was said. So it was basically a situation where they were talking about the academic rigor mm-hmm. at Notre Dame. And he was, you know, they're asking, and it's a typical question, right? Everyone knows it. You have to be a, you have to be a student athlete to succeed at Notre Dame, obviously. Mm-hmm. And in the comparison, he talked about, hey, Notre Dame is a, small Catholic institution, right? I, what do you say? 8,500 students, I think, some, somewhere in that ballpark. And he was comparing it to an Ohio State or some of the other bigger public institutions that get 60,000, 80,000, mm-hmm. whatever their, their, um, the amount of students that they have at their schools are, right? So he was comparing them and he, I, I think the, I, I, and this is not word for word here, but he basically said, if you don't go to school, if you don't go to class at an Ohio State's, and basically, they dropped the if at there, mm-hmm. right? And they were kind of like, oh, wow, you're saying that they don't go to class at Ohio yeah, State. Yeah, like the way he wrote it, because he had the if on there, right? Like it yep. says, if you don't go to class, and then he put brackets at those places. Basically, kind of like, and that's not really what Coach said. Okay, take some online classes, show up for your final. At Notre Dame, you're forced to, every day to go to class. The mm-hmm. He left out a lot in the middle. Um, and, and then they did put an editor's note free. It said that Freeman was citing Ohio state and Cincinnati's examples of large public universities with enrollments of 60 and over 60 and 40,000 respectively. This context was not included in the initial publication of the quote above, which has also been amended for clarity. So we actually, they might've just added the if back in, right? That's the thing. So, I mean, the fact to, to have an editor come back in and make that kind of correction shows that they know this was not because it, if Marcus Freeman says, like people say all the time, well, I wasn't quoted correctly. Well, I have the notes and I'm not changing it because I did quote you in proper context and I did quote you accurately. The fact that you're getting blowback is not my problem. And that, and that would be accurate. If Dennis Dial would have quoted Marcus Freeman in perfect context and said exactly what he said, and Coach Freeman was catching flack for what he said, that's fair game, right? That, that's not Dennis Dodd's problem. 
What bothers me is when you spin something or leave out very important context in an attempt to create a black eye on Notre Dame. That's what Dennis Dodd does. And that's what his intention was here. To have an editor come back in and say that is a really bad look. Really bad look. And, yeah. and then they they obviously have changed since changed that. But he, he even even with the change one, it makes it look like he's saying at Notre Dame, you're forced every day to go to class. Mm-hmm. That's not what he was talking about. Right. Right. Like, why is he hiring a bunch of Ohio State people? You know what I mean? Like, why would he say he's like you say, he's got two degrees from Ohio State. Why would he basically like kind of destroy that by to take some shot with Dennis Dodd? Like. And Ryan, when he said it, like, there's a, I did not comment on this on the board yesterday. I didn't comment it on Twitter because honestly, I was going to reach out to coach after the current, there's a, a big official visitor on campus that I didn't want to, I knew I wasn't going to get that kind of time, but I was going to reach out to him or, you know, Katie or, you know, whoever else and kind of be like, Hey, can I get some clarification on this comment? Because the, when I read it, like that doesn't sound like what Marcus Freeman is about. Yeah. It doesn't sound like what he says. And, and I know Ohio State fans like to take things he says and, and get all sensitive and in their feelings, like when he said, you know, when he first got hired about, you know, he, coming to Notre Dame or Ohio State and that kind of thing. And, and, and it, that one was like, okay, I get what he was saying and I get why they're upset. They shouldn't be upset. Like, just not everything's about you. Right. This was one where it's like, this sounds nothing like what Marcus Freeman's about. Mm-hmm. This sounds nothing like who Marcus Freeman is. And this isn't the kind of comment you'd expect Marcus Freeman to say. So I just had a feeling like, and, and then, if if like if Tim Priester would have had an interview with with Marcus Freeman and and made that exact quote, I'd have been like, well, that's unfortunate for Coach Freeman to say that, right? Like, mm-hmm. I, because I I give Tim Priester the benefit of Tim's not out there to try to, in my opinion, and and I've been reading Tim for decades. If if Lou Samoji was still with us and would have had a quote like that, I would have said, man, it's unfortunate the coach said that because there are people that I respect, they are people of integrity. That yes, we all want to have something that's that gets read by a lot of people. Otherwise, we don't have a job, right? But you want it to be an accurate thing. When it's, when I read that quote and then was like, oh, yeah, this is a Dennis Dodd piece, I immediately was like, I put no stock in that at all. And then you hear with Coach Freeman, and I love the fact that he said, send me the audio. That was right. great. Send yep. me the audio because I want to hear it. Like, at that point, Dennis Dodd's got to be like, uh-oh. Like, uh, this could this could end up not going well. If he has any integrity at all, and maybe he didn't say that because I don't think he does. But, uh, you know, and then he read it within context, and and that is the proper context. Like, and, and look, your last star quarterback before C.J. Stroud has talked about how he took all his classes online. The, the your, your last quarterback to start and win a national championship made the joke about, like, I didn't come here to do school, right? Like, now, look, I've got, res- you know, I've got some level of respect for what Ohio State is trying to do, but let's not pretend like you're trying to be like Northwestern, right? I mean, your kids do take online classes. There's nothing wrong with that. It's nothing wrong with that. And he's not saying that that's a problem. Right. Now, the the thing that I think he is accenting is when you are taking an online class, it is easier to get lost in the shuffle. It is. And I would read that into it as someone who's been involved in in this side of things. But it was not a comment like, you know, these kids, they go to take an online class, they show up for the finals, and then they don't do anything else. It's not what he was saying. He's talking about being in person. And being around, and then he went on to talking about other aspects of how they're intertwined with the Notre Dame community. They're not kind of secluded like they are at a lot of places. And it was just, it was incredibly unprofessional of Dennis Dodd. It was his typical spin. It was typical, let me say enough complimentary things to make it look like I'm doing real journalism, but let Mm -hmm. me make sure I get my, my, my silly pettiness in there too, which is what that Dolly Duffy comment was all about. Which is what this was all about, and and you know tying him into, you know Jerry Faust and all these other guys. Like, okay, how about you give proper context? Like, why are we still talking about Charlie Weiss? That was fifteen years ago. Charlie Weiss was hired almost twenty years ago, right? Jerry Faust was hired at Notre Dame when I was three freaking years old. Okay, <laughs> like two was he? Is eighty? He was eighty, I think, right? Eighty, eighty-one. I was like two or three years old. Okay, Bob Davy was hired. I was still in high school. Right. So why are we why aren't we talking about more? Con- hey, you know what? Let's look at the teams that are winning national championships. Where had Kirby Smart ever been a head coach before? Where had mm-hmm. where had Dabo ever been a head coach? Where had Dabo even been a coordinator before? You know, so you know, where had Ryan Day been a head coach before? 
Yep. So, so we've seen these Lincoln Riley, where he he had ever been a coach, head coach before he got those. He was the offensive coordinator like ECU three years before he became the head coach at Oklahoma. Yep. So why is that? That why aren't we using that context, right? Why, if you're going to talk about those three coaches, what level of success did any of those coaches have after they left Notre Dame? Mm-hmm. Charlie Weiss got fired from Kansas in what two years? Something Bob like that, Davey yeah. was a was a below 500 coach at New Mexico. <laughs> Jerry Faust never coached again, I don't think. Right. So to me, it, it, it's like that stuff you say when you're trying to make a point that's a negative point when you're trying to spin. There's no context in one way or the other. Right. And and that's who Dennis Dodd is. I, I think Dennis Dodd is is a hack. I think he's unprofessional. I think he's always had this grudge towards Notre Dame. And I'm not someone who buys in the whole media hates Notre Dame. I, you know, I've pushed back against that. This clown, however, absolutely is that way and he does this stuff and all the time like now all of a sudden you're brian kelly's cheerleader right <laughs> and he and you know it just i would love to listen to that entire interview i i would like to hear it too because i mean obviously i, I was what listening to coach freeman's do you want to call it a rebuttal to the comments? I yeah, guess we call I it a rebuttal a, right clarif- I, I think yeah it's a rebuttal yeah let's call yeah. it a rebuttal because i think clarification Mm-hmm. Makes it seem like, you know, I did say that, but this is a flat right. rebuttal of I didn't say that. I didn't say it in the context. I didn't say it in, in any way that you portrayed it in, in that. Right, right. So if you listen to the interview Coach Freeman did, it I, I kind of thought about um I kind of thought about Jimbo Fisher for a second, Brian. You remember after he, you know, had his quick, oh, I gotta say something here and I gotta get all loud and, and kind of come at it a little very childish. Coach Freeman was just so eloquent talking about this situation, you know, and I, I, it was because like you said, there are several things. It's like he has two degrees from Ohio state. Why would he talk bad about the university of Ohio state from an academic perspective? He literally has an, an advanced education from the institution. That doesn't make any sense. And he has continued to bring Ohio state people with him, right? Like you think about James Laurinaitis, that's now, on the staff that he played with at the university. But for me, li- after listening to the, after listening to his interview that he did, I'm just more happy each and every time I hear coach Freeman speak that he is yeah. the head coach of Notre Dame. Cause even in when someone tries to make unnecessary controversy out of nothing, he's just like such, such an eloquent speaker and just explains it so easily. And you're just like, yeah, that's a, that's a non-issue. Like, yeah. and I think, I think it's just more proof, honestly, Brian, because I mean, I know, I know you mentioned that Dodd's kind of a Notre Dame hater or whatever, but even when people are trying to poke holes in Coach Freeman right. so much, man, so like hard, you just, yeah. you can't find anything right now because I mean, and maybe something will happen at some point, but like at this moment, he has done everything at a very good w- in a very good way so far. He's yeah. continued to, to reemphasize the same messages over right. and over again. And I actually think that Notre Dame comes out of this kind of looking yeah. good, to be honest. Right. Coach Freeman right. does anyway, in my opinion. I agree. And, and this is the same clown that remember when when Ryan, you and I, I mean, I think we were talking at the time uh, because you and I had already started kind of going through the, the process of maybe bringing you on and things like that when all this stuff was going down. And I think I told you at the time, like, you know, what I was hearing about Coach Freeman being the coach. And then Dennis Dodd mm-hmm. comes out hearing Luke Fickle's the guy. Uh, you're not uh, hearing that from anybody in Notre Dame. I can right. promise you that. You know what I mean? And I pushed back on his stuff at the time. And, and, you know, then you start hearing, well, you know, Brian Kelly's you know, hearing the job's going to get him 15 million a year. Like this, it's not just Notre Dame though, with Dennis Dodd, he's just like this. He's just a, he's just, I don't say bad at his job and let, but then I think, but he's not bad at his job from the standpoint of, I think this is what he wants. I think he does this stuff on purpose. Right. He he's tr- just he's trying to, with Notre Dame. he's trying to get the, yes. he's trying to get the attention. He's trying to get the Correct. clicks. That's, that's why you Correct. manipulate a quote, right? To, to, you're trying to get a rise. You're trying exactly. to get a reaction, obviously. And he yeah. does this stuff all the time. I think it's, it's more noticeable Notre Dame a, because I'm, I'm, I'm someone who's always been a Notre Dame fan, grew up a Notre Dame fan. I'm in that Notre Dame universe now, but also because I do think he has an extra agenda when it comes to Notre Dame and look, Notre Dame has given people plenty of reasons to be critical of them in the past. And, and, and when Notre Dame does something that, that deserves criticism, criticize it, we'll do that. Right. That's the job. When Marcus Freeman does something that we don't evaluate as proper, uh, whether it be like an in-game decision, uh, let's say, you know, going for two when your team is up 11 already in the fourth quarter, 
against Northwestern, hypothetically, and you go for two instead of one, uh, yeah, I'm going to criticize you just like I did Brian Kelly. That's a real situation, by the way. That's why they lost against Northwestern because they kicked the field goal, kicked the t- had a touchdown, scored a two-point conversion to tie the game because no one in their right mind goes for two when you're up 11 in the fourth quarter, uh, except Brian Kelly, of course. We'll criticize Marcus Stream when he does things like that. And we'll criticize him if if there's a, a mistake here because that's our job, no matter how much we may like him or not. But don't invent crap to try to start drama. That's my frustration. And and there's too much of that going around right now. And, and, and part of my frustration is because whether it's this, whether it's the Dante Moore recruitment, what, there's a lot of things going around. Monroe Freeling recruitment. There's a lot of stuff going around where I'm like, I know that's not true or a partial truth. And it gets really freaking frustrating. And it just, it, it just, because a lot of it, it ends up, you know, hurting the program. And, and, and then you're like, then I have to spend all my time commenting on this nonsense as opposed to, you know, doing other things. And so there's just a lot of frustration that I have. And it's kind of like, stop letting these clowns in your building, stop giving them access, direct one-on-one access to your coach. Because here's the reason. I am not a fan of saying we're not going to give Dennis Dodd a credential to Notre Dame. I'm not a fan of that, right? Let him have a credential, but but let it be in a situation like like what we get, right? Let him be at a press conference because here's the deal. If you say something false, then we're all there. We all heard it. I can say, uh-uh, that's not what he said. And I've, and I've defended Brian Kelly against some things like this in the past too, where people would take something that Brian Kelly said, they would tw- – like twist it into like the like that's not what he meant when he said that and you're just trying to start problems and you know so let him do that because then we can all immediately no no, no hold on i have the audio bam here here it is this is what he said that's not what he said right and and then we can kind of we kind of go from there but when you give him one on one access it it sort of comes down to his word versus your word which is why i love the fact that Notre Dame asked Dodd for the audio right like just and I also thought too, it was smart because you don't immediately come back with, "Oh, I never said that." And then Dodd's got the audio. Well, no, nope, here's exactly what you said. It's <laughs> smart, like you know, maybe I did say that, but that's not how I meant it. And because that's going to change the, then it becomes a clarification, not a rebuttal. To mm-hmm. your point, the word you used earlier, Ryan. Yep. And and I think that is that is kind of where I view the situation is it's smart to ask for that clarification or not to, to get, ask for the audio. So you can read him, but yeah, I didn't say that, that this guy's, you know, and he mentioned Dennis Dodd's name like three, four times in his rebuttal. So he was clearly making it you know, like, I just, I read that as like, he's making it very clear. Like this guy, you know, here he goes. And and, and the funny thing is this isn't going to change any Ohio state fans opinion. And I don't care. <laughs> yeah. I mean, I've seen already seen tweets. Of, well, he, he just needs to own what he said. I'm like, did you not hear him read? Like, but it doesn't matter. But that's what Dodd does, right? It's already out there. The black eyes kind of happen. He's, it's it's going to heal quickly because, like you said, Ryan, you know, there's no there's no there there, right? right? There's no and, substance, yeah, right. And so for most of people, like, yeah, this is just Dennis Dodd being Dennis Dodd, and uh, yeah. I, I guess it really is like a Skip Bayless situation, man. It's just like yeah. thriving off of con- tr- controversy, yeah. even if you make it yourself, you yeah. know, like thriving you know. off chaos, yeah. you know, and yeah, it's, um, it, it's, it's a little frustrating because it's just, it's unnecessary mm-hmm. and it's unprofessional. It's childish. It's petty. And it shows a lack of talent. Like if you don't have enough of talent, if you don't have enough confidence in your ability to get people to engage with what you do, by just telling the story the way that it is like there's enough cool aspects to Marcus Freeman taking over that you Mm -hmm. don't need to spend this the way that it does. Just like when Lincoln Riley took over for Bob Stoops, it was a great story. You didn't need to, you don't need to create dramas, you know, Dabo taking over for, for, for uh, Tommy Bowden or was it Tommy Bowden, right? Tommy was coach at Clemson, Terry's coach at Auburn, correct? Yes. Yeah. You know, it just tell the story for what it is. And if the story, if it doesn't have enough juice, then it's just not an interesting story. Don't tell it or just know that you're not going to get a click, a lot of clicks on that story. But this is who Dennis Dodd is. This is what he seeks. This is what I think he wants and likes. And uh, I just, uh, you know, the nice thing about kind of having your own thing is you don't got to worry about playing that game anymore. And so I don't have to play that game anymore. And so I'm going to tell you what, what I think. And Dennis Dodd is a, is an absolute joke. He is mm-hmm. a disgrace to the profession of journalism. 
He is a disgrace to the profession that, that includes people like Tim Priester and Lou Samoji and and you know other great writers over the years that that take a lot of pride in doing the job the right way. And um, he's he's one of those reasons why I don't call I, I never you've never heard me call myself a journalist. And never. I call myself an analyst. And now I'm a publisher, right? And and it, it's because of people like that. And there's so much of this in media and politics and in culture and in sports. It's just like, just tell the freaking story. Just be honest. That's your job. Your job is not to play favorites. Your job is to tell the story. If you're a journalist, that's what your job should be. And um, yeah, so uh, I would love, somebody said, invite Dennis God Dodd to IB tailgate. I would love that. I would love to to let Dennis Dodd know uh, what I think about him outside of the because like like I would love to go up into a press conference and just go off but that'd be that would make me just as unprofessional and clownish as he is, sure. right? But if I bumped into him at a tailgate, that's a le- that's a different setting, you know. Uh, if I you know then then it might be like a hmm, let me uh, let me share a little piece of my mind with you. Would you would you, o- would you offer him a seat? Would you offer him a seat? Yes, I would. Oh, would you? Yeah, oh, nice. yeah I, I still would. If he wanted well, one, yeah, I would. Yeah, I mean, I, I could I, rip you and still be courteous. I mean, that's know, fair. That's fair. That, that's that would say more about me than him, right? But well, yeah. when I, I I knew after reading the situation, Brian, that the article and then listening to Coach Freeman, I knew that this was because I think most people out there are just you know gen- genuinely kind of from a Notre Dame perspective are genuinely upset because somebody tried to paint a picture about the Notre Dame head coach, right, and ma- tried to make Marcus Freeman look a certain way. From our perspective, it's very because you know this is what we do, right? Like we we produce content in the same uh, right. in the same area, so it's not only just the fan aspect of like, wow, you're trying to make Nick Notre Dame look bad. It's also dishonest journalism, right? right? Like it's just it's it's like the worst of every right. scenario and every vantage point from that right. instance too, which just makes it even worse for me personally. And he, here's the problem, Ryan. And yep. in, in, in whether it's sports, whether it's politics, whether it's about all the things that have happened in our country the last three years, what happens is, is if you are, if you are, can someone considered a journalist, right? Like when I watch political news, there's journalism and then there's like opinion stuff. You know, the difference between, you know, uh, a person who's supposedly in, in a, in a, a news telling story or situation or someone who's just giving you opinion of the things. When you're someone who's considered a journalist whose job is to tell the news and you do the things that you do and it's in sports media, it's in politics, and to me, it's on both sides of the aisle, right? Like, I mean, I don't watch any political news shows anymore, any. I'm not like, oh, I still watch this channel because they agree with me. No, they're hacks too, okay? What happens is, is when real things do happen, you've now lost the trust of the public. And, And that's the danger, right? Is tell the truth, tell the story, whether it makes your side look bad or not, because when things really happen that matter, people need to know that they can trust it, whether you like it or not, or I like it or not, that they're going to get the truth. And I just like, who does that anymore? Like, who can we say in politics or sports that you can say, you know what, that is a, an outlet that's just really about getting the truth out. There's individuals here and there. Sure. But the, you know, we're not getting that at ESPN anymore in sports. It's all yeah. opinion and spin and analysis, right? There's there's no one that does news. And then the one person that I thought told a good story was Tom Rinaldi, and they got rid of him. Yeah. And then the, the, the few good re- reporters they had, they've been getting rid of because, you know, there's no money in telling the truth and telling news. Which, you know, is a joke. But anyway, I, it's it's so sad because I, I think I texted you about this a few weeks ago. Ray Didinger's a famous journalist around the Philadelphia area. He's covered Philadelphia sports for a long time for like the Daily News. And he's been on the radio forever. And he just retired. And he's like one of the last ones, man, to, to your point where I'm just like, that guy is just he wants to tell the story right like there's no spin to it. it, it this is the right. story. This is my honest analysis. This is what I see. Right. And I just right. There's not enough of them anymore. There's not. You're right, and it's it's a shame that this is what the the controversy we're talking about. I mean, I was right. even, I was even, I, I just had like a sports talk show on. The, I mean, not sports talk show, a, a TV show on yesterday. I forget which one it even was. You have the game. What's it get, about to be? Game six of the NBA right. Finals, and they're talking about is Anthony Davis a top seven player in basketball? And I saw the take from that. Oh my like, god! I'm so glad I don't watch. Oh that. yeah, yeah. I heard that one too. The Stephen A. one, right? And I'm just like. But I'm like, why is that what we're talking about? Just because right. you just want 
two sides. Are like, the you Lakers even the, the, have the, the Lakers didn't even make the playoffs? Correct. Oh, they were bad this year. Yeah, they were bad. They were below like, five hundred. Why are they we were talking about Anthony Davis? Exactly. It, because it's not about them. Like wh- whatever happened, like having matchups and X's and O's and all this kind of stuff. It's it's all about like. It's it's all about like getting the, the they everybody wants the hot take they want that one minute clip that's going to go viral as opposed to man they had a great discussion about this analysis and this X's and O's and all that kind of stuff and and it and it it sickens me I mean look I'll be honest you you got to make tough decisions in this business and and at the end of the day if if you're if you're this is the when there's so much money in in the media it's like well I can't report this because our biggest donor is you know what we would this negative story would be about so it it just i mean do you think my life would have been easier the last five years if i would have just jumped on the brian kelly you know love train like everybody else yeah it would have a big time would have but it wasn't it wasn't how i what i built now i could have been wrong but i was giving you my honest opinion and and that's the thing that just it just it it bothers me and it just kind of sickens me And, and dennis dodd is like the epitome of that from a a journalism standpoint or a writer standpoint it's it's just like you can't take any of that clown so seriously and i and then you know and then we got to deal with this crap instead of talking about what we wanted to talk about so and I, I know we're, we're 31 minutes in and we haven't even talked yeah. about what we actually wanted to talk about today right. which is a, a shame but i i think that this is important right because honestly and this is a, a big clap for you like honestly right like you have built a site that is built upon integrity and honesty yeah. and putting out good content. We're so, going to be wrong. We have been wrong. Yeah, right. But you're all, you, here's the thing. I, whether you like me or not, agree with me or not, like the show or not, what I, what I hope people will always say is, and I know that they don't because there's idiots everywhere, is that, you know, he, he's at least telling you what he thinks. It's what he truly believes. Sure. Whether I'm right or wrong, whether I'm on, on the same page with everybody else or I'm giving you something completely different. If I'm giving you an opinion on something that's completely different from everybody else, it's not to stand out. It's because that's what I honestly believe. Sure. And that's what I've told Ryan from the minute he got hired. Don't ever feel like you have to agree with me because I said it. Mm-hmm. Uh, don't ever th- feel you have to take on the same opinion that I do. And, um, you know, there, you know that that's uh, Spanky, you're killing me, man. You would not have sacked me. Okay. You would not have sacked me. Let it go. Let it go. <laughs> but we do, but we do appreciate the super chats, yes, man. We, we do. do. I'm texting him as soon as this shuts up. <laughs> <laughs> That's my guy. Anyway, I want to move on, Ryan, because uh, we, we've we've allowed this clown to take up enough of our time. So uh, we do have a little bit of recruiting news we want to go over first uh, mm-hmm. before we dive into our main topic, which is about the Notre Dame football team, because we've been talking so much recruiting. Uh, the last few months, it's just yeah. like every time we think recruiting is going to slow down, we can get back to the team. They go out and get three huge commitments last week, and yeah. uh, and then we're we're post we're postponed again. Yep. So Ryan, let's transition a little bit. Uh, we have learned today, and I believe I believe Tom Loy was the first to report it. I'm not certain of that, so if somebody else did, no disrespect intended, but I believe Tom was the first to report it. We've been able to confirm and do a little bit of digging on this that Notre Dame has canceled the official visit this weekend for Christian Hamilton. Mm-hmm. He is the wide receiver from North Carolina. Ryan and I both liked this film. Uh, I think he was a good player. Didn't think yeah. he was a like top hundred guy, but a good player uh, filled a role that uh, he didn't. And so a lot of people ask, you know, you know why? Well, right. It basically comes down to Notre Dame likes where they're at right now. And they're going to focus their time on other, on closing on other places instead of trying to push for a guy that they liked, but didn't necessarily love. Right. And I kind of put him in the same categories like Malik Elzey in regards to how he's viewed as we like the kid. He's a good player. In other years, this might be a guy we want, but in this year, when you look at the board, I just think there was other guys on the board that they liked better. You can agree or disagree with their decision, but there's just other guys that they like better, and they would rather focus on closing on those guys at this point in time. Yeah, no, I mean, it's said perfectly, right? Like, Because, I mean, I honestly, and we've talked about this, I like Christian Christian Hamilton for that slot role. Mm -hmm. I probably would have been a take for me, I mean, to be Mm -hmm. very honest, and to put it fully at transparency. This is not the fact that Notre Dame – Cancel the visit is now moving yeah. on from Christian Hamilton is not going to change my opinion. I think Christian's right. going to be a really good, good football player, college yeah. football player. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. I, I think that he fits that slot role so well with his ability yeah. ability to ma- manipulate space. I will say the positive of this is if Notre Dame made this move, that tells you that they feel better about where they yeah. are with Ronan Hannafin, 
Micah Tease, Jaden Greathouse, the the what the board Rico is Flores. Left. Rico yeah. Flores, the board outside of Christian Howe. Here's what I also think it means. I also think think it means that they are more and more focusing on Micah Tease as being an offensive guy. I, I think that and, and you know, just reaching out some sources, that's I've I've kind of said I, I feel good about saying that, right? And, and so that's so somebody said, they only take four. No, they still are pushing for five. Four is the minimum. That's the number they got to get four. They're only gonna. They were always only gonna ever take five. It was the right five, and one of those guys had to be a guy that could have some positional flexibility. Well, they're pushing for two guys like that, Ronan Hannafin and Micah Tease. But what I think this not pushing for Malik Elzey, not bringing in Christian Hamilton, to me tells me that 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 they feel good about the the four, the first four. Mm-hmm. And then with with Micah Tease, that they're really going to kind of zero in on him being that that guy, because Micah Tease fills that role as well. Micah Tease mm-hmm. fills that, and I would actually argue that I feel I feel like Micah Tease brings a little bit more outside receiver. And this is something you and I Agreed. were talking about about Christian Hamilton. You like him a little bit more than I do, but it's close. Mm-hmm. You you know I view him yeah. as like a top one fifty to one seventy five kind of guy. I think yep. you probably have like what one twenty five to one twenty five to one fifty, yeah, right? So we're really bar. close. He's a uh-huh. good football player. It's just I don't think they want to go to five for a good football player. They want to go to five for a guy they really like. And and I also believe, uh, again, correct me if I'm wrong, Ryan, that you and I both like Micah Tease better than him as a player, even as just a receiver, right? Like right. take away that I think Micah Tease is better on defense than he is on offense. Same. He's yeah. still a better wide receiver, I think, than Christian Hamilton because I think he's got a little bit more juice. I'll say this: I think Christian is a more natural wide receiver. That's the thing I like about him. Like he's a very natural offensive player. Yeah. Where like with Ronan Hannafin and Micah Tease, they're just athlete, athletic guys that are still learning. The, you know, they're kind of they play both sides, and and I think that they view the athleticism as better. Obviously, Ronan Hannafin not only is he faster than Christian Hamilton, but he's a lot bigger than Christian Hamilton. And then with Micah Tease, I think they like the fact that he's got a little bit more juice and the fact that he can play two positions. So if Micah Tease doesn't make it at receiver, you right. could still find a home for him. Mm-hmm. But I think what this shows, you don't make this move, Ryan, mm-hmm. if you don't think you at least have a shot to close on Micah Tease and Rico Flores and Jaden Greathouse and Rona Hannafin. Absolutely. You also don't make this move if you're still leaning towards just giving Micah Tease a shot at receiver and then moving him to defense. Right. You're making this move because you're willing to go all in on giving him an opportunity to play wide receiver. Le- legitimate you. opportunity, right? Like not just not just a not just a you know a, a slap on the contract and then eventually you can take it a different way, right? Like that's not that's not what this move is. And I think that that's the player that most signifies there's more because we talked about all those players, and I think that we feel we still feel even though Jaden Greathouse pushed his commitment date back, yeah. right? We still feel good about Great House. We feel have to change there, Ryan. Right, exactly. So we still feel good about that one. You still feel really good about Ronan. You yeah. feel good about Rico as long as He's you know. He's probably the one I feel least confident in of the right. four that we feel Notre Dame's leading for right now. Exactly. Yeah, and then Mike Atiz has kind of been the question, right? It's like USC, Notre Dame, Oklahoma's out of the picture. What like what is his allegiance? Because. He's a tough guy to get a read on at times, mm-hmm. right? And he obviously likes Notre Dame a ton, but we know he also likes USC. Like, and he's for sure going to be a wide receiver at USC. Like, there's no doubt about it, and right? So, Ryan, have they been on him? I mean, that, has that been the position that they've pushed for him from I, the beginning? I, I think it's been the, okay. the whole time. Yeah, if I if I okay. remember correctly, I, I don't even think they've ever even mentioned defense for him for, at USC. So, because I know Oklahoma was they wanted him at safety, right? And USC, I believe, has always been wide receiver. So. I, but I think that this is an indication that Notre Dame feels very good about where they are with Micah even more than we do currently, mm-hmm. right? Because I know I, I felt good about it for a while, and then I kind of teetered down a little bit. You've kind of been a little down on it for a while, and you know, deservingly so, with, with just some of the tea leaves when you kind of read everything. So they must feel good about that one because now they're putting themselves in the situation. I mean, let's call it what it is. If they now, they cancel the Christian Hamilton visit, right. so if they don't close on Micah Tease, then there is no slot in this. In this, there's no true slot. Yeah, in this I mean, there's they, not. Yeah, it, it, yeah, they they've got to basically hit a home run to have that kind of player. Now, again, I think in Tommy Reese's offense, he doesn't feel that he has to have the traditional slot. 
the Fair. Xavion Bradshaw type, the Christian Hamilton type. I think he feels he could put a Jaden Greathouse in the slot. Last year, he was pushing for DJ Williams in the slot uh, just because of the type of pro cell offense he has. I personally think that they need guys can make plays after the catch. I think every offense in college that's going to be running RPOs needs that. Absolutely. And of course, there's different ways to do that. And I think, you know, Braylon James can do that in, in different ways. I mean, so sure. I think that is something that I think is missing, but I also – you got to look at it like in their view, it's like, but do we take a guy who we think is a good player, but not a difference maker simply because he fills a stylistic need that we have. Right. And when you look at the, and we've talked about this before, Ryan, when you look at the 2024 receiver board, there's a lot of guys like that on the board like that. Yeah, there is. So I think that's part of it too. It's like, look, if we take him as our fifth guy, if we take Christian Hamill as our fifth guy and we like Christian Hamill, just, again, this is, this is not a, Oh, they liked him, and now he's going somewhere else, and he's not good. He's a good football player. But if you take him, that's one less scholarship you can use next year if you make, miss on Micah Tease. And we've warned before, you got to be careful not to completely rebuild your depth chart in one year. What I think you do is you take four that you like now, and and then, you, you know, hey, look, we're, we're going to need a fifth guy for a year, so let's go get a grad transfer next year that can give depth. Because the one thing that fans have to remember is, yes, Notre Dame needs numbers. But for the next couple of years, they're not hurting for alphas. That's the thing is they don't need Jordan Addison to transfer in for them to be okay. They have right. the players with that potential, Lorenzo Styles, Tobias Murrayweather, Deion Colsey, you know, and then this incoming class, which already has a top 100 recruit in Braylon James. And if you add a Ronan Hannafin and you add a – a Jaden great house. And, 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 you know, if you're getting in a situation where like Jaden Thomas and Rico Flores, you're like, you're like eight, nine receivers. You're in a pretty good place. For sure. Right. And mm -hmm. so I think their thing is we'd rather take four guys that we really like this year and then use that fifth spot for next year. If we can't get a guy this year that we also really like, and they really like Micah Tease. Right. So I think that's also, you, you, you can't rebuild it in one year. Cause what's going to happen is if you bring in five guys now, and and one of those guys really can't play. Well, what if Christian realizes in a year, like, dude, I'm the tenth guy on a ten in the ten man depth chart. Like, they're not going to play me. And then sure. he leaves, and now you're back to square one. But now you've missed all those months of potentially recruiting an extra kid in next year's class. Mm -hmm. so I think those are the explanations for it. I'm not necessarily saying that's what I believe. I'm just saying like these are the things you have to consider when you look at how to put a roster together. And, and again, so I'm not necessarily taking an opinion on it. Mm -hmm. But I understand it, and and these are the things that go into these types. It's not as easy as just like we like him or not. I mean, sometimes you like a guy, but you're like, yeah, I like that guy, but we just right. can't take him right now. I, there's defensive linemen that this staff likes. There's mm -hmm. no doubt that I think, Ryan, that they could have pushed for and maybe got, but it's like, but no, because he's not quite the level that we're looking for in this class. Same right. thing a linebacker. There's good linebackers they, that they liked, but they're just like, you know, if we're going to bring in a linebacker, it needs to be a guy that we really like. And they really yeah. liked Preston Zinner. They really liked Drake Bowen. They really liked Jaden Osbury and Darren Gallette. Those are the guys they really liked. So that's why they didn't push as hard for Tamir Robinson. Right? Mm -hmm. That's why they didn't push as hard for Phil, Phil Pachotti. Good football players. Yeah, I like Phil a lot. You know, yeah. but guys uh -huh. that are just like, but we like other guys better. And we're not going to take a guy just to take a guy just because he's a good football player. We're going to really make sure that we're building our depth chart smart and spreading these things out a little bit more. I think that's a... It is certainly understandable and wise strategy, in my opinion. All I'll say is if if they if Notre Dame ends up with a five man class of Braylon James, hypothetically, of course, Braylon James. Well, that one's not hypothetical because he's in the class. <laughs> Braylon James, Ronan Hannafin, Jaden Greathouse, Rico Flores, and Mike Atiz. I don't think anybody's gonna be upset about that, right? Like that is a really good wide receiver group. The one thing I'll say though, Brian is there is a little uneasiness cuz in my opinion I would love to hear if you if you if you mm -hmm. agree with this or if you have a little bit of a difference of an opinion for me Christian Hamilton I think is a little more ready to play than let's say a Micah Tease as a true receiver so I'm looking at this now and I'm just kind of like Braylon James I think is going to be mm -hmm. a star but is he going to give you everything year one that you want? In, in right. A, is he a guy that can come in and be a right. 40, 50 catch a day guy? one guy? Right. right. So you're looking at him, Ronan Hannafin. I kind of feel the same way, like long term, outstanding, but short term, what are you going to get back? Right. And then you got Mike Gatiz, who we've talked about. It's, it's a little raw as a full time receiver because he isn't a full time wide receiver right now. Mm -hmm. Rico Flores, I think, has a little bit of that where he can come in. I think he could compete for though. But the, the uneasiness for me is now. 
Notre Dame also needs to land Jaden Greathouse. They right. need to, in my opinion. And right. again, there was a lot of uneasiness on the board when I kind of dropped that the recruitment date's going to be pushed back. But if you don't get Jaden Greathouse now in this five-man class, you don't really have a lot of guys that are – because like you said, you don't need a guy to be a dude next year on, uh, uh, necessarily. You're going to have right. Lorenzo Styles and Tobias. But you and do need Deion somebody Colsey that can come and, in. Right. But you do need somebody that can come in and can take some snaps. At that least can play some one football. guy in this class. At least right. one guy in this class has to play as a freshman. You're absolutely right, Ryan. I'll, 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 I don't disagree with what you're saying at all. I think of the between him and Mike Atiz, I think this is what I was saying earlier. Like that's what I that's what I meant by he's the more natural receiver. He knows how to run routes. He knows how to work against zones. Where Mike Atiz is just sort of an, a really good athlete, and that tends to happen with guys that are two way players. Like I said, I say the same thing about Ronan Hannafin. Ronan Hannafin dominates in high school because he's just freaking athletic and. Bigger and stronger he's and faster. Bigger than and faster than, he's than everybody just, else. He's, yep. and, and he's he's a great football player, but he's not necessarily a technical football player yet. And he's more fundamentally sound on defense because that's the position he's played longer. And so with like with those guys, it's it's like the but as I've said a million times, as a coach, Ryan, I, give me the more athletic guy, the more explosive guy, the guy with the higher upside. Because I think in the slot, in the slot specifically, I don't think that stuff is as important as a for a freshman. If you've got that, hey, just get him the ball and let him go do what he's got to do. I can game plan for that. I can or I can scheme for that if that guy's good enough to get on the field. Just running arrows and, yeah, and screens I mean, and right, yeah, 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 I get right. that. I get you some looks. I, I, it's not that hard to teach you how to do a crossing route, right? I mean, it's not that hard to. It's a lot easier to teach a kid how to run four yards and then reroute based on how the guy is is setting, you know. So to slip underneath or get outside or you know use my hand. It's a lot easier leverage, to teach that yeah. than a kid who's never had to get off a press before against Cam Hart. You know what I mean? It's just some of those things are a little easier to teach. And if a kid isn't doing that, there's more you can do with a slot to get him in motion, to move him, to stack him behind that can kind of clean up some of that stuff. So if you need that, you can get that out of him. And so when I look at the 2023 receiver depth chart, you know, you, let's say Tobias Merriweather and, and, and Deion Colsey both break out to a degree this year. Right. And, and, Tobias is your X, Deion's your W, and I'm and I'm feeling completely fine with Lorenzo Styles dominating out of the slot. And he can move outside too, and you can move guys around and all that kind of stuff. And then you look at a guy like Jaden Thomas, who I think can play everywhere. I think Jaden Thomas can be sort of a, a, a kind of a, a handyman, right? Can do a little Swiss bit of Army knife. You know yeah. I mean? yeah, it's, yeah. A, it's a, a really good one too. There is he can play a little slot, can play a little X, can play a little W. Yeah. You know, then you bring in Braylon James who can play the outside slot spots. Yeah. I actually wouldn't mind seeing Ronan Hannafin get some work in at the slot early on. Big slot, yeah. Yeah, uh -huh. same with Jaden Greathouse. One of those two guys I would try to work in with with Lorenzo early on. We've we've talked yeah. about Jaden a lot in the slot. Yeah. I, I like I mean, if that's your style, I because because right. he's a different type of after catch player than right. a Mike Atiz is gonna be, obviously, right. but he can do some work after the catch, man. He's right. got kind of that physical slip type of type Correct. of build to him. Yep. If I'm running Clemson's offense, there's no way in heck I'm putting Ronan Hannafin and Jaden Greathouse in the slot. No way. Because they run a different offense. They run a, a, a spread where that guy's got to be a dynamic after the catch guy. Not having that guy is why I've been – one of the reasons why I was critical of Clemson's offense going into last year's because they didn't have that guy, and they need that. Notre Dame's offense is different. It's a more vertically oriented pass game that's not as wrapped up into the slot RPOs and those type of things. And – you know, and and so th that's the thing is there's there's plenty they can do with what they have to be effective. I mean, we saw Jaden Thomas get a get a jet sweep, or was it a jet sweep? It was a jet sweep, and then make Ramon Henderson miss in space. Right? Yeah, so, I mean, yeah. There's some things that he can do from that position. I, we, you know, like you said, Jaden Greathouse can make plays after the catch. It's just different than Micah Tease. Absolutely, it's more catch a catch an option route, make that guy miss, and then get space and and do some damage. Where Micah Tease can take a look screen, make some guys miss, and then use that yeah. speed to, to crease a guy. Yep. And, and so it's just different. And then you just would know what you have and you would game plan for it. Cause I think Lorenzo styles isn't necessary. He's a guy, he can take a bubble screen and a look screen, but that's not necessarily his primary strengths. He can do those. His primary strengths are vertical downfield route running, you know, ball skills, but he can also do those other things, which is why we're so high on, on Lorenzo as a player. But I just feel like you don't need to force this slot issue. That was also – it's also part of my reason why I'm still frustrated they didn't take Xavier Bradshaw last year. Yeah. Because I felt like he – to me, I graded him out higher than Christian Hamilton because Xavier is more explosive than Christian Hamilton was. Mm -hmm. And I just felt like 
that's that that's a bigger miss to me than not taking Christian Hamilton. Because if you'd have taken Xavier Bradshaw last year, we're not having this conversation. Yeah. Xavier, not. Um, not Xavier. Christian reminds me of, and I know we're comparing it a little bit to Rodney Gallagher too, because that was kind of the quote unquote replacement, right? For a Rodney Gallagher. Gallagher always seemed to me that he was a wide receiver playing quarterback, obviously on his level. Yeah. Christian Hamilton, it seems like more like a quarterback that transitioned to wide receiver, right? Because he's not like yeah. the, He's not the straight line fast guy, but he's a guy that understands spacing and has good awareness to his mm. movements, right? So, yeah. I mean, again, I think I probably would have taken Christian Hamilton in this class if it was my decision, yeah. but I definitely understand why. And I, again, I think there is good indicators of why they're making this move. I think there is potentially good things to follow. I think there's a little bit, there's a final piece to this too, Ryan, mm -hmm. which is, I think they're betting on themselves a little bit too. True. Which there's always risk involved in that. But I would rather you do that than not take the swings. Because here's the deal. If you get, let's say they got Christian Hamilton on campus this weekend. And again, we like Christian Hamilton. And if he would have committed Notre Dame, we'd have wrote real positive stories about it and had a really positive thing to say about it. But the final piece of when we do the what's next is here's the reality. This means you cannot take Hannafin, Greathouse, Flores, and Micah Tease. Somebody got to say no to. And I think when they did their evaluation, they said, I would rather take that shot knowing that we're not getting Christian Hamilton than the other way around. Because the, the other the other thing I'll say to you, Ryan, and, and, and I'm curious if you agree with this or disagree with this, I feel like a guy like Christian Hamilton is a little easier to find than a guy like Micah Tease. Because of the fact yeah. that Micah Tease, not that they're necessarily tremendously different as receivers, and I said why I like Micah Tease better. Yep. But again, Mike Atiz is a guy that could go start for you in another position if he doesn't pan out on offense. If, if Christian Hamilton comes and he's the ninth guy at receiver, you can move him where? Right? right. Whereas right. with Mike Atiz, if he's, I mean, again, he's going to get a legitimate shot. I'm talking about if Mike Atiz doesn't move up the depth chart, mm -hmm. he's too good to just sit there on the bench. If there's a need somewhere else, you can move him somewhere else. Right. I would personally give him a shot at the position he wants to play. I'm adamant about that. That's more my personal conviction because I went through that in, in college myself uh, and having not getting that shot. So it's, I'm, I'm, you know, I have a biased opinion towards that, but I think that's another reason too, Ryan is, is I feel like they're, they like obviously Rico Flores better. Mm -hmm. They like obviously Ronan Hannafin better and Jane Greathouse better. I mean, those two are the top of the board of the, uncommitted guys the un the guys who aren't you know publicly committed to Notre Dame right now it's, it's Hannafin and Great House and then Flores is also a guy they really like a lot and they've liked him I mean they like him more than I mean in a, full disclosure Ryan I think yeah well, I won't speak for both of us I'll let you speak for yourself full mm -hmm. disclosure I I they like Ron Rico Flores a lot more than I do I think he's a good player but I think Notre Dame's higher on him than I am sure at this point in time uh and, and that's the one where I think we could have a more of a debate about mm -hmm. is you know, would you rather take Christian Hamilton or Rico Flores? That that that, that would be a more interesting discussion. That that would be the conversation for me, to be honest, because I I do think Rico's another guy that could play a little bit in the slot yeah, too. So agreed. that could be some potential agreed. there as well. I I think that the staff is going to value a Micah Tease, and I mean I do anyway. I value Micah Tease over Christian Hamilton. Just is the slot option in the class because I agree. Like Christian Hamilton is going to be a slot in college. Like that's just mm -hmm. all that's probably all he's going to be. And there's nothing wrong with that because you could be a dynamic player for that role. But I think Mike Atiz could play to the field a little bit too. I think he could play outside a little bit because I think he's got more juice to him, right? Like I think mm -hmm. that he can press vertically a little bit more and he could have upside as an outside route runner. So I I don't disagree with it. It's just again, you are betting on yourself though. You you need to and, and we've, we have applauded this staff so far. I mean, we just had a recruiting show on Monday where we basically spent two hours just saying Notre Dame is the best thing ever. Best thing since sliced <laughs> bread, right? Recruiting. Oh, but no, now man, I really like a good sandwich. I, I do like a good sandwich too. But um, they are putting themselves in a position where you have to close. You have to. Right. Like, if not, right. the board is not expanded. It is getting smaller. Right. It is not getting bigger. There's not a lot of options left on the board. Right. Options. And I applaud them for this. They are going after options that they love. Like you said, right. they're not taking players that they like. They are only taking players that they love in this class. And I, I give them full credit for that. No doubt about it. 
they're betting on themselves. And that's what we said earlier. The risk with that is, is if you place the bet improperly, you're left with nothing, right? Like it's like going all in on the roulette table. Like you, you better hit this. It's like going all in on black or going all in on red, right? Like every dime you have or putting it on one number. Like if this hit, if that number comes up, boy, whoo, whoo, you're going to be all right. But if it doesn't, you're going home and you're, you're, you're doing this to get home. You're hitchhiking home, right? Cause you got nothing. And that's where they are finishing off the D line. That's kind of where they are at linebacker. It's where they are at corner. Honestly, right now, although it's not quite because there is Josiah Wagner, you know, coming in this weekend. So uh, it's what they're doing for the third safety. It's what they're doing at running back. It's what they're doing in a lot of positions. I mean, really, other than offensive line and corner, they're in a position now, Ryan, correct me if I'm wrong, where if they don't land the guys they have on the board, they're just not going to have anybody else at that, right? And and O-line kind of, because again, there's two guys left on the board. Mm-hmm. They, they We believe they would take both. That's what we've been told. They would try to do whatever they can do to make it work uh, with Monroe Freeling and Charles Jagasaw. But receiver now, there's nobody, there's nobody else on the board beyond who the takes are, except maybe Malik Elzey, right? Yeah, but you're not going to take Malik Elzey, I don't think, because you missed on Micah Tease. You would mm-hmm. take Malik Elzey if you missed on Jaden Greathouse or Ronan Hannafin or somebody like that. And then corner, you know, you've got three for two basically. Linebacker, it's Jaden Osbury, Samuel and Pemba. They would take both, and that's it, right? I mean, there's nobody if they miss on those guys. Defensive line, there's nobody if they miss on those guys. If they want a third safety, I don't believe there's anybody on the board but Caleb Downs. So yeah, they're very much in a okay, we're betting on our ability to close situation. And right. so far, I can understand why they have the confidence in themselves that they do because they've pretty much, you know, there's been some misses, but for the most part, they've kind of gotten who they've wanted. Yeah. And so I can understand, I can understand their optimism. In that there's and, and there's always going to be some misses, right? And I, I, I mean, this is, this is new, Brian. I mean, we're, we're like, you just mentioned Malik Elzey. Malik Elzey on rivals is ranked as the 110 player in the country. He's a good football I, I, player. Yeah, he's a good football yeah. player. I don't think he's quite the 110 best player in the country. No, he's right? like but, more in the Micah, Micah, Miles Boykin range, like 180 right. to 210. Sure. Know, 220, 230 is more of where I would have him, yeah. And Notre Dame is killing it so much on the recruiting trail that we're not even talking about Malik Elzey, right? Like right. he is in, he is a, I mean, let's let's be honest, he's a plan B type of player. Like it, it's a, we might take him if we miss out on player X, Y, Z. And, like, and I'll and, say this, they like Malik Elzey. Sure. I yeah. Think, I, I have, I have, every time I've ever talked to source over there, it's always, no, we really like Malik Elzey. Like when he's a good football player, it's just, there's a couple guys that, you know, you, at some point in time, you have to make, okay, do we like this guy better or not? You know, and, and, but like you said, Ron, there's nobody that I know that's like, nah, he's not that good. He's not a no right. kid. And in other years, they, he'd be a no brainer take. I'd have taken him over Warren Walker last year, any day of the week. Mm hmm. You know, like 100%. It's just this is a unique year where you've got some really talented kids on the board and, you know, you're, you're able to take advantage of potentially getting two kids from Texas due to the fact that your receivers coach had that connection. Yep. I mean, that's the other thing is if you don't hire Chancey Stuckey, I don't know if they're in a situation where, they, where they're, they're, they're in the same situation with Drayden Greathouse. Maybe Malik Elzey would have been a take by then or not. You know, so it's, it's all those things kind of play into it. But, uh, yeah, it uh, – it's they're definitely betting on themselves, Ryan. There's no doubt about that. Yep, and obviously that is the main point of of conversation from recruiting. I know everyone's very pumped up about Richard Young being on campus at Notre Dame. We kind of put this out there. Was it yesterday, the day before that? We probably won't have too much intel until uh, into how that visit went yeah. until after Richard is concluded with his visit. Because honestly, he just doesn't talk to media much. So we need to kind of hit some other sources. For that standpoint. So that's the main talking point, though. It, we will be talking about some of the other things um, pretty soon on the message board. So if you're not signed up for the premium message board, I would go to boards.irishbreakdown.com and I would sign up because I know we just got 99 problems with BK1 on there finally, Brian. I saw that this morning, man. And I, if you're on the message board, I don't think anybody is, I don't think anybody's disappointed with that, uh, with that investments right now. Yeah, There's one person is. On there. One person got the boot last night. Oh, did they? He, he, he's probably upset. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, man. Got to yeah. hear that story off the air. <laughs> yeah. That's what I was texting you about last night, but somebody was already catching Z's. Hey, man. It was like 10.50 when I got I know, the text. Right? All right, I get so. it. Trust me. If I had a one-year-old, I'd be in bed every night. I would, 
Oh, I wouldn't man. See, I wouldn't know what it's look like to be at, you know, dark outside. I'd Julie, Juliet did not go to bed until 940 last night, man. She was mm-hmm. not sleeping last night. It was, uh, you yep, know, yep, yep, yep. not, not, not yep. too much fun sometimes, uh, parenthood, yep. but then you see her smile and it's all good in the end of yep. the day. So yes, sir. Yep. So Ryan, let's, uh, let's, let's dive into the second, this third topic, I guess. Uh, and that is what was the original show was going to be about, which is, kind of carrying on what you and Vince talked about yesterday with looking at the Notre Dame offense, because it's interesting. The Notre Dame offense is not getting the same preseason love that the defense is where what was fascinating about your guys' conversation yesterday is, you know, like all three position groups on Notre Dame's defense, the line, the linebackers and the secondary are ranked as one of the 10 best groups in the country by at least one, you know, magazine, obviously one of, and there's only two of them so far. And so it's like, you know, there's there's some there's some talent there, but you know, what how good will it be? Will they reach that potential? Should they be there? Whatever. Offensively, there's only one group that's even in the conversation right now. Like not even like and that's the offensive line. The offensive line was ranked number 1 by uh Lindy's. I forgot what Athlon had them. They had them in the top 10. Let me let me pull up the old Athlon here, Ryan. They had them in the top 10. I just don't think it was number 1. They had the offensive line ranked eighth which i i think is fair based you got, on you got the old athlon i got the old lindy's in no front yeah no yeah i got my lindy's right here yeah. right so i got the same i think i got the same lindy's as you do is that mayor on the front no i got i got the um so i'm in more in like big 10 country so okay. they actually have Fo- they actually have fosky on the front of this one okay which is pretty yeah, i dope. got this one yeah i got yeah. the michael mayor one here for for the for the uh for the viewers out there we okay, got isaiah there fosky go. on the front there yeah there you go and then uh mayor's on this one as well so he's kind of hidden behind CJ Stroud and they make Blake Corm who's like four foot seven look tall, bigger and taller than Michael Mayer, but whatever. Hey man, he's five, eight. All right. He's four, he's yeah. five, eight. Give him it five, is eight. what it is. Um, I wonder if it's storming outside. Rita just, Rita just crawled down b- below my feet. So I wonder if she's scared of something. So yeah, it's uh, yeah, she's a little scaredy dog. Sorry about that. Uh, so they have a number seven quarterbacks. And, and this one is interesting because they actually rank it kind of by position. They go quarterbacks, running backs, receivers, offensive line, mm-hmm. where normally it's kind of like pass catchers more so where it's receivers and tight ends. And or they'll kind of count receivers as receivers and tight ends. Notre Dame is obviously not in those. And, and I honestly, Ryan, and this is kind of what we'll go through is I don't know if I would necessarily disagree with that. So let's let's first talk about the Notre Dame offensive line, Ryan. First or eighth, I would say if I had to pick one of the two, mm-hmm. I would probably go again. It depends on what your premise. Like, are you are you going full projection, or are you also kind of taking into account somewhat of what it was last year? I think if you're going full projection, I can understand putting their name one. I wouldn't just because there's a lot more I want to see. There's some lines like Michigan has a lot coming back. I right. it's kind of like you know. The, they won the they won the Joe Moore Award last year. They were a good line, a l- little bit overhyped, but they won the Joe Moore Award, and they have mm-hmm. what four starters coming back, something like that. Yeah, and and you know Notre Dame's got a lot of turn. I think the they, talent. They also M- Michigan also has that center transfer from Virginia, Virginia. that was an All American right. last year. Yeah, good player. Uh huh. So I don't know if I'd put him one right now, unless I'm going full projection. Who is number one based on everybody reaches their full potential? Then I think we could have an argument that Notre Dame could be number one, but I'm just not there yet. I'd say I'd probably put him like right in the middle, maybe even closer to where Athlon has him at number eight, just because there are some answers, some questions that we need to have answered. Right, Ryan? I mean, you got two true sophomores to tackle. You've got a center coming back from an injury who you may move to guard, miss the whole spring. You have right. a center stepping in, another player potentially stepping into the starting lineup at center who started six games last year and was not good. And Zeke Corral. Now we think he is going to be much better based on what he did in the spring and what he did as a center two years ago. And then you have Josh Lug, who's been okay, been solid. So I just I mean, if you're a top 10 group, you're a pretty good group, Ryan. A tenth out of a hundred and thirty plus teams, I would probably have them closer, like six to eight is the range. I would have them. Yeah. Where would you have the Notre Dame offensive line? Again, this is coming into the season based on a combination of proven experience depth talent and your faith that the that they're going to be prepared to play at, at a somewhat strong level if they if if if, if harry he wasn't coming back they're not in my top 10 right but right. harry he coming back that factors in so i'd have them like six to eight ryan where would you mm-hmm. have the Notre Dame offensive line and why 
You know what's really r- interesting, Brian? When you look at these Lindy's rankings, I feel like some of the uh, some of the positions are ranked more based upon what is what is the definites coming back, right? Like mm-hmm. the proven commodities, and then some of these are very projection based because you had right. Notre Dame at number one and Lindy's obviously for the offensive line. They had Ohio State at number two. I'm like, right. That's not based upon last year, obviously. Oh, like, line was pure projection. Exactly. Yeah. So it's pure projection. I I think that if we're talking about just projection and talent level, then I'm okay with Notre Dame being ranked number one because if it's just pure projection. But like, let's be honest, they were not a better offensive line last year than Michigan, like you said. They were not a better offensive line than BYU. Who BYU has several mm. good starters coming back. Baylor has several has both offensive tackles coming back and a center that were very good from last year's unit. Oregon has a couple guys. Georgia has the center Van Prawn and Broderick Jones coming back who were good players. So I would say I, – I think that we're in a similar ballpark. I would say seven to nine, six to eight, somewhere yeah. in that ballpark. I would definitely have them ahead of Georgia and Cincinnati and Clemson. Clemson's offensive line being on there is like, wow. That's, yeah, that doesn't make any sense. That's that holy sense. moly. Yeah. Like they must really love Jordan McFadden because the rest of their offensive line is just, you know, not yeah, good. unless they think some of those freshmen are going to emerge this year. But, I guess yeah. they're counting on a junior breakout from Walker Park. Yeah. So I, I don't, I don't know. And then, and then uh, uh, Athlon had Texas A and M fifth, and Wisconsin seven. I think Wisconsin could have a good offensive line this year, but I thought A and M being fifth was a little bit of a like uh, they lost their they they weren't great on the offensive line last year, and they lost their best player. Yeah, they have they have a couple sophomores. They have Ruben Fathery at right tackle and Bryce Foster, who yeah. are both good players. But like you said, you just Highly lost it. Kids, that sounds like a recruiting yeah. thing, maybe a little bit. Then Ryan, if what you're yeah. saying, yeah, yeah, I, I think so because they, they're not even in the top ten for Lindy's from Texas A and M's perspective. And like you just said, they just lost the top twenty pick in um in Kenyon Green this past draft too. So and didn't they a, lose their offensive line coach to USC? I believe so. Yeah. 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 It's definitely, so, it's definitely a new offensive line coach. Yep. Yeah. So, I mean, they, the guy that built the line they had last year is now, now uh, at, at USC. So that one was also a little bit of a head scratcher to me. Um, mm-hmm. I was like, I, that one didn't make a lot of sense, but you're always going to have that. Right. And, and that's always going to be part of the conversation. So yep. we would, we're similar range. I think six to nine is sort of the max of what we both had. I was six to eight. You, you threw nine out there. So, I mean, I think that's kind of in that, in that ballpark here, I'm trying to find out who their new offensive line. Steve Adazio is Texas A&M's new offensive line coach. So, I mean, he's a good offensive line yeah. coach. I just, I kind of not feel a good like head that. coach, not a good well, head coach. And, and I, I kind of <laughs> wonder, like, is he going to be in a situation of like what the guy last year was? Doug Marone is like been a head coach. Is he going to be happy just being an assistant coach again? Uh, you know, I, I don't know. If he is, then Steve Adazio is a good football coach. I don't know if he's necessarily better than the guy that they have. He's a good football coach. Uh, as an offensive line coach, very good, very Agreed. good offensive line mentor for sure. So I guess the question now, Ryan, is where do you think this group can be and what do they got to do to get there? I think for right. me, there's three questions. I think we, I, I believe, Ryan, that they can get to number one. I think that Notre Dame has a chance. I'm not betting on it. I'm not saying it's going to happen, but I wouldn't also be shocked either if Notre Dame goes out there, barring, assuming good health and and has the best offensive line in the country. I, I don't disagree at all. I mean, like I said, if you're if you're talking just pure projection and talent level, mm-hmm. I think that they are in the conversation right now. Like I could see them getting there because I mean there's a lot dependent upon it, right? Like we're talking about I just mentioned there's two super sophomores on the Texas AM offense fly. Notre Dame's in the same boat, right? Like they need those sophomores to be dudes and they right. need the rest of the line to kind of fill out. And you need to have Coach Eastan take obviously a next step with some of this talent. But I I agree with you, Brian. I think I mean who are the more talented lines that are on this list other than them? Like, I mean, I guess you can make an argument that there's a couple of Georgia guys that are really talented, Ryan. Right? Right. They're Ohio State. If Paris Johnson hits, like, maybe. Yeah. Okay, I, cool. I, although but... I think Ohio State's talent is a little overrated. A little bit, yeah. I, I don't think Dewan Jones is the guy that people make him out to be. Matthew Jones see... is a nice player, but he's not a yeah. dude. A, a, l- a little bit of a segue. Did you see the uh, Dewan Jones official measurements, by the way, on the thing? Yeah. Oh, yeah. man. That is a Holy... big boy. Yes. <laughs> It's one of the biggest so offensive cool. tackles I've ever seen, man. For people that have, uh, I mean, obviously nobody else has seen it, but just real quick, the right tackle for Ohio State, Dewan Jones, verified six eight and a half, three seventy, thirty six and a eighth inch arms, eleven and five eighth inch hands. Brian, he had a he had a eighty nine inch wingspan. I've never heard of anything yeah. like that before. So, yeah. but the problem is with Dewan Jones. I talked about this yesterday with someone. I was like. 
yeah, that's impressive, but he's not good. So right. that's that's tough. That's a little right. tough right there, you know? Right. So. right. I, I, yeah, I just I, – I mean, I think Michigan should still be good again. I think that they're going to have they're going to have a good offense this year, assuming they get the quarterback situation to, to make more plays. Ohio State to me has a top ten line, Ryan. I just think it's a bottom of the top ten, not top of the yeah. top ten. I mean, there's some players. I mean, like I said, Paris Johnson has potential. He's transitioning from what right? He was a right guard last year, correct? To left tackle. Yep. You know, Matthew Jones played a lot of football at Ohio State. Started a bunch of games. Mm -hmm. uh, Luke Whipler's a good football player. He's a, I mean, he's, yes. he's, he's there Zeke Carell, right. But he's just had a chance to play more because that spot's been open and there wasn't a Jared Patterson there in front of him for the last few years. And of course, you know, there's, there's Jared Patterson. So, you know, they'll have some players, they'll have some talent. It's just, I, I want to see what, I want to see the job Justin Fry can do. I'm, I'm more confident that at the, by the end of the year, Ohio state will have a top 10 line now than I was, I would have been if, if, if coach stud was still there. Because I do mm -hmm. like Justin Fry as a coach. I think he's a good football coach. I mean, he agreed. That UCLA offensive line was very well coached and they were physical. He did a really nice job at BC. I would have taken him over Jeff Quinn when he interviewed for the, the Notre Dame job. But I don't know if his net, the tools he's working with are quite to the level of the tools that Harry Heastand is working with in regards to the town around him. I'm just going to be honest with you. Right. And then you have Heastand plus Chris Watt. Not enough people are talking about the fact that Chris Watt is also part of this conversation too. And I haven't I mean, heard anybody mention that, that honestly. Yeah. I, don't, yeah. I haven't heard it at all. Yeah. yeah. It's mentioned here and in, in right. Notre Dame circles. Yes. But nationally, I, I don't see, I mean, their graduate assistant coach was a D division one offensive line coach a year ago. Mm -hmm. You know, there's not a lot of people that can say that. And was the GA on the, the team that won the, you know, was a finalist for the Joe Moore award two years ago. So what has to happen, Ryan, you kind of got to it. Obviously, the tackles have got to be as good as we think, right? They've got to be as good as we think. I think that Jarrett Patterson has to be healthy. I, I think that's a big key. If he's not 100% the player he was last year, then that hurts the line a little bit. And then the third piece is it would be very easy to go with to go with Zeke Carell. But I feel like Zeke Carell is at least going to be a solid player if he's healthy. I think right guard's the bigger thing for me whether it be Josh Lug stepping up and being the player that you know that, that Vince thinks he can be and that, I, that he's shown to be at different times. And I only say Vince because Vince, he was one of Vince's underrated guys or disrespected guys in our breakdown last week. And, you know, he's got to step up and be healthy. And if he does, I think that right side could be a really physical, good run-blocking line with Blake Fisher and Josh Lug. If he doesn't, then somebody like Rocco Spindler or Billy Shrouth or, or Andrew Kristoffic, you know, who's, who's still going to be there trying to, you know, battle for a job. You know, I think the assumption is that he gets bumped out of the starting lineup. I don't know if that's a given. It could be maybe it's Josh Lug that gets bumped out of the starting lineup. You know, there's all types of different battles that will happen. But I, I think th that to me, the right guard position is the bigger question for me as far as will they be number one or number four or number eight or number ten. I mm -hmm. think that those – the tackle's got to have to be what we think they're going to be, and, I, and I'm confident. Of those three things, I'm most confident in that. Yeah. And then Jarrett Patterson's got to be healthy. That's more of a question mark for me. And then the right guard position is probably my biggest concern. It's the thing I'm least confident in of those three aspects. Do you think it's like, because obviously offensive line is such a cohesive unit, obviously, right? It's so dependent upon all five guys. Would you say it's kind of like a, you're only as good as your worst soldier type of situation, right? Like, I, Yeah, because I think 2016 is a great example of that. I mean, you had two All Americans on your left side, and Quentin Nelson and Mike McGlinchey, who not not became All Americans. They were a second and third team All Americans that year in 2016. If you go back and watch Alex Bars that year, Alex was pretty good at he was real solid at right tackle in 2016. His first year as a full time starter. Sam Mustafer had a solid year. You know, got thrown under the bus by Brian Kelly a couple times because that bum Sam Mustafer couldn't snap in a hurricane. Uh, you know, so um, I'm saying that sarcastically. Uh, you know, and, and he had some first year in the lineup mistakes. You know, he had the snap against Stanford that went for a safety, but those things are going to happen in year one. But other than that, I mean, he also had some really good moments. But that right guard position was a train wreck for mm -hmm. most of the year. Once they, and if you look at their production that year, once they put Mark Harrell in the lineup, and Mark Harrell was like a solid player, you know, more of a guy you want as a, a good 
versatile backup, can play some center, can play some guard, can play some tackle. If you remember Mark Carroll, you're a yep. real solid quality football player, but a guy you'd rather at Notre Dame, you'd rather have as a swing a depth piece, you know, right. a sw- swing guy. That's a really good way of putting it. Mm-hmm. But if you look at once they kind of inserted him in the starting lineup, you started to see the offense start playing better and better and better. I mean, if you look at that year in 12 games, Notre Dame averaged over five yards of carry. See, one, two, three, four, five times. Four of them were in the final five games of the year. No, yeah, five times. Four of them were in the final five games of the year. Mm -hmm. They rushed for over 200 yards in two of the last three games and then ran for a buck 54 against USC. Would have ran for more, but they fell behind big in the second half. If you remember, first play of the game in that 16 game against USC, Josh Adams runs like 70 yards and, and gets tackled inside the five. You know, so they averaged over five. I'm sorry, those were those numbers were yards per rush, not mm-hmm. total offense, the, I mean, yards per rush. So they got a lot better down the stretch when they went to a different lineup and it because it helped solidify things. And, and so – I think there's a lot to what you just said, Ryan, is is one one ask, especially if it's up the middle. Mm-hmm. If it's up the middle, it's a problem. And and what often gets lost in the in the 17 play the 17 line is yes, Quentin Nelson and Mike McGlinchey get a lot of the love, but Sam Mustafer was solid that year. Alex Bards was really good in 2017, really mm-hmm. good at right guard in 2017. And then, you know, Kramer and Hainsey were solid. I mean, they were just they weren't great. They had their moments where they were pretty good. But they were just steady. They didn't have a bunch of young guy first time in the lineup mistakes. They were just, I mean, just across the board, there was a, that was just a, a, a solid group. 2020 was the same way. There was nobody in 2020 that was as dominant as Quentin Nelson was in 2020 or 2017. Right. But they were just really good across the board. And when you saw Patterson come out and there was some more uncertainty inside with Lug and Zeke Carell, that's when Notre Dame's offense kind of sputtered a little bit down the stretch was with, was with when they had that, but it's just one position. Cause remember Kramer got hurt and then Patterson got hurt and it just started to create some issues. Actually Patterson got hurt. Then Kramer got hurt. Excuse me. So yes, continuity is a big piece of that, but I think that's also why I have a little bit more confidence in this, in this line. Cause let's say Patterson does get hurt and let's say, let's say Chris Stoffix, your number six, he can play tackle, he can play guard, he can play center. He's your swing. Mm-hmm. If Patterson goes down or Lug goes down, you got a kid that played had started seven games last year and has played played solid football, ready to just slide mm-hmm. into the lineup, right? As an insurance piece, yeah, right, yeah. exactly. Let's yep. say one of the tackles goes down. You can either slide Josh Lug, a third twelve game starter at right tackle last year, or you could put Tosh Baker in the lineup, who mm-hmm. I think is going to be better. He got some starts last year. He's going to get better under Coach Eastan. Oh, you know, the point is. Or you can move Christophic out there at right tackle, right? That there's options of guys who have played. And I think that helps protect you a little bit if you do have an injury. And I think that's part of it because you're going to have guys are going to get banged up, right? Like 2015, Quentin Nelson missed two games, mm-hmm. right? I mean, he, you know, he got knocked out of one, missed another, and Alex Barr slid right in and they didn't miss a beat. You know, 2020, Jared Patterson got hurt. And, you know, I mean, guys are going to get hurt. Last year, Josh Lug gets hurt before the bowl game. I mean, they, they had some other things kind of go on. Uh, they were – Blake Fisher gets hurt in the opener, right? And 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 then Michael Carmody gets hurt. And, and so you just get in a situation where injuries are going to happen. Mm-hmm. Part of my confidence level for Notre Dame is I think they're going to be okay because there's some good football players that have played that you can slide in. And I think that factors into to my confidence level as well with the offensive line. Yeah, I mean, there's – no matter how the offensive line ultimately shakes out, you now have depth. Like it's, right. it was a shame that there were so many injuries last year and there was so much up and down. But the one positive is that you did get a lot of players playing time last year. And that's like, I, again, I'm right outside of Philadelphia. And that happened for the Eagles two years ago. Guys like Nate uh, Herbig that used to play at Stanford played mm-hmm. a ton. Um, the offensive tackle out of Auburn, his name is escaping me, played a ton. And now they're just rotational players right in the back end. But if someone goes down, you have created depth for yourself through adversity. So it, mm-hmm. it was unfortunate, but it also actually is long-term. It does help the offensive line a little bit as far right. as you feel more comfortable now what the depth looks like. But I, I agree, Brian. I think that Jared Patterson staying healthy and being the, the pillar of the offensive line is critical because he is your one 
known commodity that's going to be a four-year starter. Like you know what you should expect from Jared Patterson when things around him especially are going to be a little better in theory. And mm-hmm. then two, you need those sophomores to be dudes. Like you need mm-hmm. them to be the guys that you think they are. If they are, then I think Notre Dame can have the best offensive line in, in yeah. college football. Will they win the Joe Moore Award? We'll see because that's more of a – there's a there has to be storylines behind that a little bit in the right? team in the team effort. You know, right, you could have exactly. a great online, but if you're averaging 25 points a game, you're probably not winning the Joe Moore Award. You know, let's be honest about that. There's a, otherwise Iowa would probably have more wins. I mean, if we're being honest, and and again, I I don't think Michigan would have won it last year. I think that's where the storyline aspect that you just talked about. I'm sorry, Michigan had a really good offensive line last year. They were not the best offensive line in college football. I mean, just in my opinion, anyway. Mm-hmm. They no, I, I agree with you. So. Offensive line we talked about, right? And we will answer some questions at the end. So if you do have some questions, we will we will have a Q&A at the end. It won't be super long because we went way long on our first couple topics, but we will definitely get to some Q&A. So if you do have some questions, fire them, fire them in there now, and we'll get to them uh, at the end of the show. Ryan, let's talk about the backfield, okay? Sure. Obviously, Notre Dame is not in anyone's preseason top 10 in the backfield. We're going to we're gonna include backfield as quarterback and running back. We're going to talk about them both together, which is what uh, Lindy's does. And I think for these – it's, if you're going to do the list this way, then I don't think you should have running backs and quarterbacks separated. Like if you're going to go secondary linebackers, D line, O line receivers are going to include tight ends then you should also do it the way Lindy's does it. So we'll just look at it that way uh, is what I think is the way to do it. And that, so that's what we're going to do today. I, there's Notre Dame has no business being ranked in the top 10 of the preseason. I mean, it just, there's so little proven production. And that's the thing is like, there was a, a comment on our message board where, where somebody was a little fired up that the, the, the offensive line or the running backs weren't considered one of the 10 best groups. And if you look at the running back group that are, is coming back, I mean, Lynn, Lynn Athlon did have that and they did not have Notre Dame including the top 10. And with all due respect right now, Notre Dame shouldn't be in the top 10 at running okay. back because they're just, okay. there's just not enough proven production. And I said this in my running back preview online today at irishbreakdown.com they lost more yards last year and just from the 2021 season in Kyron Williams and the 10 yards from Sebo Flemister than they have coming back in career rushing yards at, at running back. They they're barely over a thousand. You know, most of those are from Chris Tyree who missed most of the spring with concussion and battle turf toe last year. So it can't just be a talent standpoint. Otherwise you're just going to put teams that, that have highly ranked recruits on it because they haven't proven anything, but you think they're talented. Quarterback, same thing. Tyler Buckner has no business being listed amongst the ten best quarterbacks in the country coming into the twenty twenty two season because he hasn't he hasn't proven himself to be that just yet. So I think we can be we can make quick work of that part of the conversation, right, Ryan? It's like, yeah, th- no, they should not be in the top ten. I think they're no. probably a backfield. I think they should be considered a top twenty group, in my opinion, because with the poten- with the potential put in there because potential right. is part projection is part of this conversation. And, and so, whereas with the offensive line, we're projecting a line that a bunch of dudes have started games before. With running back, it's kind of like, well, I think Kyron Williams can be a really good player. I mean, Logan Diggs can be a really good player. I think Audrick Estimate can be a really good player. I think Jadarian Price can be a really good player. I think Chris Tyree, when he's healthy, is more like the guy we saw in 2020 and not the guy we saw last year. I think there's a lot of proje- projection, but really comes down to more so the quarterback position is the one where there's the most projection. But yeah, you need to be able to look at the talent and say, yeah, but there's a lot of talent there. And I think that's really where the focus is on. Can this become, and that's the question, Ryan, is can this group become, by the end of the year, one of the 10 best backfields in college football in a year that I think has a lot of really good backfields coming back, in my opinion? There there are. And th- this is why I didn't, don't love the inconsistency from Lindy's anyway. It's because the offensive line, I felt, was pure projection. And this one is much more... Ohio State at one that has their starting quarterback, Heisman finalist, and you know sophomore sensation running back right. in Trayvon Henderson. Like that it's is, understandable. If you did not have the number one, right? You know what I'm gonna say, right? You should cancel the magazine. Is, Find is something else to do with your career, right? Exactly. You're not good at this. Yep. I mean, so <laughs> I mean, all I mean, but seriously, all all these teams are like Alabama has Bryce Young and then a bevy of five star running backs that are all and Jameer Gibbs transferring in, right? Then you have USC. That has the die kid, the transfer from Oregon, Caleb Williams. So you have teams that have known commodities. I'd right? still like, say USC is a little bit of a projection with a Caleb little bit. Williams, though. But, a little but bit. to your point, you got a 1,200 yard rusher and a quarterback that 
started for a top 15 team last year. Correct. Exactly. Exactly. So the whole top 10, I mean, the only team that has any projection really is like Michigan at nine. I mean, just because what's uh, the quarterback didn't do great last year. The kid that was committed was to game manager game at one point. Yeah. yeah he, Blake Corum's a good player, but then Texas at 10. I mean, but that Blake is was their number two back last year. He was a yeah. change of pace guy. Not, right. you know, Hassan Haskins was their, he was their dude. dude. Yeah. Four yeah. Last year. Agree. And then Texas, obviously, with Bijan is, is carrying that because we haven't seen what Quinn Ewers really is yeah. yet. We'll see about that one. But. Well, see, here's the thing, Ryan. I feel like they were even inconsistent within this position group. Because if you're going to produce so much projection, which I kind of feel like they're doing, then Texas should be higher because, you know, Quinn Ewers is a five star. I wouldn't do it. I'm just saying, like, right, you're gonna, right. because Bijan Robinson, in my opinion, is the best running back in college football. Oh, he's back. a dude. That, that he, might, he might end up being the best running back I've scouted. I've already taken yeah. some like preseason looks at him. The kid is special, man. Yeah, he's really he's, special. He's really good. Yeah. Now the question that the other side is, is what are they going to do at running back? And that that's kind of my thing with Tennessee, Ryan, with, with where they are. I, I get it. Cause Hendon Hooker was really good last year. Sure. They have good backs, but I don't know if, if I, if I would look at their backfield and say that I'm definitely taking them over, for example, like a BYU or I mean, excuse me, a Utah. Mm-hmm. You know, because Utah's got Cameron Rising coming back, right? Yeah. But you know, I, I believe Tavion Thomas is coming back, correct? Yeah. He yeah. Over eleven hundred yards last year, twenty-one six, touchdowns, six two two forty. Yeah. This spring, he's yeah. a load. <laughs> I mean, he, he's he's a he's a you know transferring in from Cincinnati, he's a beast. Yep. Uh, you know, kid, kid. I mean, kid's a good football player. Mm-hmm. And and here's the thing: he had he missed a game against Arizona. He had one carry for one yard against Washington State, one carry for zero yards against San Diego State, and still rushed for a thousand yards last year. Yep. You have TJ Pledger, I also believe, is coming back this year, correct? Nah, he was in the draft. Is, so is he's he was gone. in the draft. Okay, yeah. that was dumb. You have Micah Bernard coming back, and fortunately for him, he won't have to be covering people like he did in the Ohio State game. Because he's a he's, decent running back, man. He's, he's not he bad. He's a good running back. Yeah. yeah. So you look at it, you say, Boy, you know, that's that's a pretty good backfield. With all due respect to Tennessee, I'd probably have them higher. Even mm-hmm. though I definitely think Hendon Hooker is a better quarterback than Cameron Rising, Cameron Rising was a solid, steady, Very game solid. manager type of player last year who can do. He doesn't get enough credit for what he does with his legs, in my opinion. Yeah. He averaged like six yards a carry last yeah. year or something like that. Yeah. 6.7. 6. 6. 7. Seven. Yeah. yeah. It was crazy. 99 yards. Six, I mean, because you got to count sacks, count as that. I mean, sacks exactly. are part of, of your rushing yards. And I'm looking at it last year, Utah gave up. I mean, only gave up 13 sacks for 85 yards, so I guess he didn't get sacked a ton. Yeah. But still, 499, and, it, and they don't do a lot of, like, designed runs for him. I mean, he's a, he's a good scrambler, but they'll, they'll, they'll run a read zone, and he'll pull that sucker and take off with it, you know? Mm-hmm. So I, I like that. I don't think that backfield's getting enough – enough do as well i thought bc at number eight was an interesting one it's, i was about to ask you about you because obviously they have the they have the garwo kid right back at running back who's mm-hmm. actually a good player thousand yard mm-hmm. player very underrated doesn't get much talking point and then they got Dracovic coming back obviously right. so it's it's interesting to say the least i don't it re- it requires some projection because how's still going to come back and the only reason it requires projection is because of the injury exactly and i always get nervous when a quarterback injures his throwing hand or his throwing wrist. You just right. you don't know how the bones are going to heal. You don't, and especially since they kind of brought him back before he's fully healed. Mm-hmm. You know, did it did it grow back improperly, and you don't have the same snap or the you know whatever. He looked fine in the spring game, but yeah, that's that's one that's got a little bit of projection to it to me. Well, it also it also has projection because they're replacing four or five starters on the offensive, on the offensive line, line too. Right. So how effective is the run game? Is it going to be as effective right. as it was last year? Right, so. it's a fair question. Yeah, fair, very fair question. Tennessee was an interesting one, but I'm I'm fine with that. I mean, Will Levis was. I I don't like Will Levis. The projection he's getting for the NFL, I think that's absurd. Will Levis is a good college football player in that system. Yeah, the bigger talented. question for Kentucky for me is what's their offense going to look like now that their offensive coordinators in the NFL. That's fair. the bigger question for me. Mm-hmm. What does Notre Dame got to do? Right. Well, what is the what is the max for what Notre Dame can be this year from a backfield standpoint, and what do they have to do to get there? in your opinion? It's a great question. I I mean, I look at this, Brian, and I'm just like, okay, Ohio State, Alabama, that's going to be tough to get over, right? I, But after that, I mean, I you could convince me that Notre Dame gets into the top three to five. I mean, you could. If, yeah. if Tyler Buckner is what we think he can be, because if he is what we think he could be and he gives us the dual threat element of the game, then that makes all your running backs better. And I think that that's the one thing about this is all the, the, running, the units that are listed as far as running backs are concerned, 
most of them just have one dude, right? Like we talked about Tavion Thomas from Utah that was sitting at number seven. But if Tavion Thomas goes down, they don't really have depth. Notre Dame has a lot of depth. It might be unproven. Right. But I really think that, I mean, Tyler Buckner, I mean, the quarterback's always the key, right? But for me, Tyler Buckner's ability as a dual threat quarterback to unlock every aspect of this offense, I think is critical because I think if you are mixing and matching Chris Tyree and hopefully Logan Diggs and Audric Estime and Jadarian Price, I think that that's going to be one of the deeper running back units in all of college football. So it's very dependent upon, for me, how good is Tyler Buckner in year one as a starter? Yeah, that's the key. Because, look, there's not going to be a a Trayvon Henderson in this group. There's not. As much as I like the running backs, there's not that guy on the roster. There's no B. John Robinson on the roster. What they do have, however, is some Travis Dye types, right, or better. I mean, Travis Dye was a system guy. He was a product of a system. And, you know, Chris Rodriguez, Patrick Garwo, you know, guys like that. Like, okay, they have some guys like that, you know, good football players. They have a lot of those. What they don't have is that dude at running back. So for them to be a group that's considered a top five backfield, they're going to need the quarterback to be that dude. And he Mm -hmm. can be, but he's got a lot, you know, he's got a lot to prove. So then it comes down to, okay, is the combination better? So like Patrick Garwo is a good football player. Notre sure. Dame's got three kids at least that have more just God-given talent than him. Oh, but yeah. They, but what they don't have is his proven production. You know what he's going to give you. Mm-hmm. You know he's going to answer the bell week after week after week. You don't know if this group is what they're going to give you. What you also don't know, Ryan, is, is this group going to answer the bell week after week after week just from being there. Chris yep. Tyree was battled turf toe last year. He missed most of the spring with concussions. Logan Diggs tore his labrum in the spring. J- Janarian Price was banged up most of his junior year. Never really missed games, but you know was a little banged up. He's a freshman. He, you know he's not going to be a, a 180 carry guy. He mm-hmm. doesn't have the physique that Trayvon Henderson had last year. I mean Trayvon Henderson like physically could step in as a freshman. Like that dude can be your dude. And even they even then Ohio State didn't necessarily put that bell cow roll on him. Yeah, last year they they played other guys to take my, that. My know, John Williams right. and Master Teague, exactly, and, yeah. exactly. Yeah. So even then, even though he had a better physique for that, he didn't have to be that dude where he's getting twenty, you know, twenty touches a game. Uh, so so Janarian's not that guy. So if you lose guys, you don't want to thrust him where he has to play fifty plus snaps a game and get twenty plus touches a game. Mm-hmm. And then of course Jabron Payne, talented as he is, has barely played really any football the last two years because of injuries. So I think those are the question marks at running back. It's like, are they going to be able to answer the bell every week? Like Trayvon Henderson is going to answer the bell. Trayvon Henderson is going to answer the bell every week, right? B. John's going to answer the bell every week. At least that's what they've proven so far. Zach Charbonnet, like those proven. Right. He's going to answer the Travis Dye is going to step up and answer the bell every week. Right. That's what this group has to prove. And then, and then quarterback, because if they, if they, if they're healthy at running back this year, Ryan, the production is going to be there because of what we just talked about with the offensive line. I mean, if, if Chris Tyree is healthy and he's behind this line, he's going to average seven yards a carry. You know, he'll, he'll get eight to ten carries a game and average six and a half to seven yards a carry and, and be a home run. I mean, he hit three 50-plus yard touchdowns last year, and he, was, and he wasn't even healthy for much of the year, you know, and, and they were clutch touchdowns too because he had the 96-yard kick return, the 55-yard reception in the fourth quarter against Toledo, and then, of course, the 53-yard reception against Oklahoma State. So – you know, he's a home run hitter. Janarian Price can be a home run hitter. You've got a guy like Audric who can be more of a pure between the tackles guy. Logan Diggs, if he can be a more consistent player and just sometimes it's okay to just get three yards. You know what I mean? You don't have to bounce everything. I think those, you know, the, the talent is there. It's just can they put it all together? At the end of the day, Notre Dame being a top five to ten group is going to come down to the quarterback. And mm-hmm. can can Tyler Buckner produce at a level that puts him in this conversation? But also, more importantly, can he win? I think that's the big part about it. Because, like, say what you want about C.J. Stroud, and he maybe one-dimensional, didn't run last year. Kid went 11-2 and put up tons of yards. You know, Bryce Young, his first-year starter, took took Alabama to the national championship game and would would have a ring right now as a national champion if he didn't lose his two best receivers in their last couple games of the year, including right, right in the middle of that title game. You know – Cam Camp Caleb Williams is a little bit of a different deal for me, but he had some mm-hmm. he had some real I mean it's some moments last year where he looked like a five star quarterback. For sure. I mean, if, if they don't bring him off the bench against Texas, they lose that game. I mean, mm-hmm. it's, it's no doubt about it. 
So I, I think when you look at it, that's going to be the key. Tyler Buckner is going to have to be that guy that produces and wins a lot of football games. For and sure. if he does that, then I think they have a shot to be in this group. Now, I don't know if I could – I don't know if I would say that I think they get to three because I think Quinn Ewers is going to play at least good enough. I'm not a big Quinn Ewers fan. You know that. Yeah. But I think he's got a great – he's got a great offensive mind coaching him. Mm-hmm. If he's just not an idiot, and that's not a guarantee with Quinn Ewers, if he's just not that, then he's at least going to be good, right? Sure. Like the, and but Bijan is so good, so good that I think that that adds to it. Now I also think Texas won't. Texas is going to have better depth this year at running back too, Ryan. Uh, Roshan Johnson's a good player, and they yes. also have the um, what's the the is it Keelan Robinson was the Alabama transfer, right? Yes. yes. Yep. Yes. Yep. Yep. So that's the other thing is is they don't have to rely on him, and I and I believe they signed uh, what's his first name? His last name's Blue. Uh, oh, Jaden yeah. Blue, Jaden Blue, yeah, no. yeah, Jadon Blue, something, believe Jadon maybe, Blue. yeah, something like yeah. that. But like he he sat out last year for you know for uh, because of you know basically he didn't want to get hurt before you know he could get his NIO deals in college. Mm-hmm. He's a really good player, you know, and he's a kid that that can help you as a freshman as well. So they're gonna. Th- that's the other thing about Texas. I would argue that Notre Dame could end up having the deepest running back room in, in college football, but right now I'd probably go with. Texas or Alabama. Sure. Because I don't think Alabama has that dude. I know Trey Sanders was a five star, but he's never. Well, Jameer Gibbs is probably going to be their guy. But I I don't view him as that dude. I think Jameer is like a. I mean, he's never been that at Georgia Tech. No. You know, um, there's a lot of his assumptions about what he'll do. Right. And and a lot of assumptions, well, he would have been better behind this, that, and the other. That that may all be true. You know, I like Mm -hmm. Jameer Gibbs, but let's let's also be honest that. You know, the, the kid rushed for 746 yards last year. He averaged – he rushed for 492 the year before. He's averaging less than five yards of carry in his career. Mm-hmm. So, I mean, he's still got a lot to prove. Now, he's a great sure. all-around player. Talent, But yeah. is he like that that take-the-game-over runner? That I don't know. Because, like, Najee right. could do that if you needed him to, right? Like, Brian Robinson sure. did that last year in the, in the semifinal. Can – can you know, so I think there's – there's someone's going to emerge at Bama. I just don't know who that's going to be. Right. You know, and, and will it be anyone that's on the level of Bijan? No. Will they have anyone that steps up and is on the level of Travion Henderson? No, they won't, but they do have depth. Mm-hmm. But I also think that's why Bama's group may end up not having a great one player, but I think that's the group to me that compares most favorably to Notre Dame is because Bama may not have that dude at number one. You know, Trey Sanders may be between the tackles guy. Jameer's your all do it all everything. You know, you've got Jason McClellan coming back, I believe, on that team. Yep. He's you know he's a good player. It's more of like a you don't have that guy, but man, you got four dudes that can play and they have different roles, and that's kind of how I see Notre Dame. There may not be a thousand yard rusher this year. There may not be. Yeah, but you're just gonna have a bunch of dudes that just have their moments throughout the year and have their roles, and as a whole, the production is there when you include the quarterback. Yeah, well, I think I said in in the one preview show we had where I, I could see Notre Dame having three to five guy, three to four guys, excuse me, that are five hundred plus yard rushers right. this year, right? Like I think now, that did you include the quarterback, or you? I include the quarterback back? in that. Yep, quarterback yep. is included in that. Uh, let me ask you this, Brian. I think this is a good conversation piece because obviously the consistency of a run game is obviously dependent on how good an offensive line is. If sure. I told you right now that Lindy's is absolutely correct, Notre Dame has a number one offensive line in the nation next year. Would you go any higher than five if I guaranteed that to you? No. No? Still no? No. Because okay. I need to see what happens outside. Fair. I mean, because we saw that in 2020. I wouldn't have said Notre Dame had one of the five best backfield, backfields in 2020, and I think they probably had the best offensive line in college football that year until the injuries late in the year. So uh, you see Rita made her appearance. She was getting a little hot under the desk because she went and laid down on her bed. Uh, but no, I, I would say no. I, would, I wouldn't guarantee that they'd be top five. Just because there's some really good top fives, if the next part of the conversation checks out to just be in the top, if they're if the receiving core is in the top fifteen to twenty, then my answer is yes. If you were to add that caveat, the receiving core, like if we would have done this group last, mm-hmm. you say the receiving core will finish around twelve to fifteen this year. O line will be number one. Will the backfield be ranked in the top five? I say yes, absolutely. Got it. Because you'll have then enough pressure on the per- you'll, you'll, you'll take enough pressure off on the perimeter that it then opens up some room to run with your backs. Yes, then I would put them in there. 
That's fair. That's very. You'd also fair. have to promise me one thing. One more thing. Does What's Tyler that? Buckner play at least eleven games? Mm. Mm-hmm. That would be the other piece of it. Because yep. as much as I like Drew Pine, you can win a lot of games with Drew Pine, right? You know my stance on Drew Pine, but you're not going to say they have one of the five best backfields. It'd be there. Sure. Then they'd basically be Michigan last year if Drew Pine's right. a quarterback. Now, look again, they made a playoff because mm-hmm. that game manager, right? That point guard. Michigan had a point guard quarterback last year in Cade mm-hmm. McNamara, like a John Stockton type of point guard. Yeah, but he wasn't winning you games. He didn't need to until you got to the postseason and you played Georgia, and then you needed a guy that could run around and do some stuff because they were getting their butt kicked up front. They didn't have yeah. that, and he couldn't do anything. And that's what's killed Notre Dame so many times is once you get into a situation where your line can't dominate because the other team's pretty good too. Now, they, even if they play well, they're they're not dominating. Then you're going to be in trouble if you don't have a playmaker quarterback. And that, that Drew Pine would be Michigan Michigan this year and last year with Cade McNamara quarterback, which again won a bunch of games. But can you can you beat the best of the best with that? That's a bigger question mark for me. You know, the one team I'm surprised isn't in the top 10, not, not saying that I would have them in the top 10, but I'm kind of surprised that from a media perspective that they didn't try to put Georgia in here somewhere with uh, yeah. Stetson Bennett coming back and they have like Kenny McIntosh at running back who was a big time recruit, yeah. Kendall Milton, like those types of guys. I know, again, we talked about this list more, was more known commodity versus projection, mm-hmm. but I'm surprised that they didn't try to get Georgia in there somewhere. You know who else I'm surprised isn't in there that I think we should have a, a more of a conversation about, and I think it's more of the the Power Five bias. Why isn't Coastal Carolina in the top ten? Grayson McCall and all those boys. Yeah, yeah. I mean they got two running Reese backs White. behind for yeah. over a thousand yards last year, mm-hmm. uh, and 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 had success in, against some of the better opponents. So I mean, again, if this is just a, if this is just Power Five, then sure. But that's a pretty good backfield. There's a lot of Power Five teams that would love to have Coastal Carolina's backfield. Would you agree with that? I mean, there's several teams on their name schedule that would like to have that backfield, if we're being honest about it. So yeah. that's one that I thought was a, I was a little surprised that that group wasn't on there. And if Bo Nix is back, I'm just saying this to tick Ryan off. If Bo Nix was back, Auburn is definitely in the top 10 in the backfield. Oh, uh, well, too many's <laughs> at Oregon now. So <laughs> I like Bo a lot more than you do, but uh, uh, Tank Bigsby's an inter- interesting player. That would be more oh, of where it was coming ta- from. So. Tank's, Tank's a very talented yeah. player. Yep. So and I, then yeah. another team, another sleeper team to, to look out for this year is possibly having a, a group. And you, I think you know where once I say it, you're going to be like, yep, I knew you were going to go there. Uh-huh. Uh, NC State. That's okay. another team. Well, they, they lost they lost both their running backs, though, yeah. is the only thing yep. with that. But Leary's going to have good really young good runners, season. though. They got some yeah. good young runners that I like uh, coming back, and then I really like Devin Leary. That's what I said, sleeper team. Like, that's a team that I could see jumping into that when the season's over with. So that's that's the backfield. Ryan, let's talk about pass catchers. This is receivers and tight ends. And I think what's funny is you have to include the tight ends here because where else will they be? You're not putting them in at the offensive line, and there's no category for tight ends. So I'm assuming – that they're with the receivers. I was a little surprised that Alabama was ranked number one by Lindy's over Ohio state. Yeah. Same. Not only that, but over Ohio state over USC. I mean, there's a couple groups. I mean, like, I mean, are you just basically saying that you're just assuming that, you know, Burton's going to be a Jermaine, dude and yeah. You know, Jermaine, like, Bur- Jermaine, Jermaine Burton and the other transfer they had from yeah, um, Louisville. From Louisville, Harold. Oh, they, Harold. Yeah, they have to be dudes, and I, I think I guess the they separation is. Yeah, yeah, I know, I know, I yeah. know. They weren't dudes, but you, you, you need them to be dudes, I guess, right. for this projection because Ohio State's obviously going to be better at wide receiver. I guess yes. the separator is Cameron Latu versus whoever's the tight end from Ohio State. Sure. I guess is the separator. Sure. I mean, Who and Latu's Ohio good State's tight end because I know they lost the. Is, I know they lost Ruckert. Isn't it um Stover? Isn't it Keith Stover? Is it going to be Stover? I think I it's one I'm of them. Sure. I know I we think, have an Ohio I think G. State Scott, fan. G. Scott's a tight end, I think. In yeah, that Archer's now, so. uh, Archer four five two is an Ohio State fan in our chat, so uh, maybe he can let us know who who's expected. He said Kate Stover. Kate Stover. Uh, you know who Notre Dame recruited as a as a as a edge player, a really athletic kid. But so, so think, did they. He was an yeah, originally a defense they don't man. Throw to the tight ends a ton. Ever. Where I think the tight end is is more integral. Alabama needs a tight end that's productive because of the way they run their offense. Ohio State doesn't need a tight end that catches. They're like Oklahoma to me. You know, I think they don't need a tight end to step up and and be a good player. They can make do without it. I think the other thing about Ohio State this year is they're going to be bigger at receiver than they were last year. 
which means I they needed Rucker to kind of provide that big bodied presence in the pass game last red, year. In red some, zone. There you go. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. And and so I don't think that's as much of a need now as it was last year because they've got Marvin Harrison who's six four. Because Emeka is going to be in the rotation most likely this year. If Julian Fleming is able to get in the rotation, he's not tall, but he's a you know thick, strong kid. I think when you look at it, I don't think they need that tight end as much. And, you know, you just look at what those receivers did. In the, I mean, we saw a glimpse of what this receiving core is going to look like against Utah. Mm-hmm. Now, the caveat is, is they were beaten, converted running back because of the injuries. But still, there were some good players at Utah, and they just destroyed Utah secondary. And it was this group. I mean, everybody that was dominating that game, I believe, is coming back. Correct, Ryan? Because yeah. Olave and Garrett Wilson, neither one of them played in that game. So mm-hmm. I'm I'm just looking at what this group has proven. There's nobody in Alabama's depth chart that can sniff Jackson Smith and Jigba right now. Who is as a player? Who, who is their leading receiver coming back that was on the team last year? Is it Jacory Brooks? I, I believe so. Because you said because you said it was on the team last year. And Harold right. had like 400 some yards last year. It wasn't even like he was dominant. Yeah. Jermaine Burton had 26 catches for 497 yards last year. Yeah. Like now you could say, well, that offense is different. I mean, that's, that's fine. Yeah. But, Burton, but, Burton was misused. There's no doubt, but yeah, I mean, but there's not a lot fine. of, there's not a right. resume on right. him. Right. Exactly. Right. Whereas I can, I can point to Jackson Smith and Jigba and say, he's in the conversation for the best receiver in all of college football, Sure, much less better than anybody that Alabama has. I'm trying to look up Alabama's uh, stats from last year. Now, Ryan, it would be, yep. I mean, Cameron Latou is your overall leading receiver last year that was right. 26 catches for 410 yards. Which is pretty good after for a tight end. That, right. After that, it's Treshawn Holden, 21 100. catches for 239 yards. Ja'Cory Brooks, 15 for 192. Mm. JoJo Early, 12 for 148. Javon Baker. Javon Baker left, right? Yeah, Javon I mean, Baker and yeah, um, the other just, freshman. Yeah, a guy A. Hall. Yeah. I yeah. mean, so and – I'm, and I'm – you know, you look at Ohio State and they've got – Jackson Smith and Jigba has more production coming back than than the, the, their entire receiving core combined, mm-hmm. maybe double. I mean, yep. even, even definitely not double if you include the transfers. But even if you include the transfers, he had more yards last year, I believe, than their entire receiving core. So putting Bama number one didn't make a lot of sense to me because Bama's wasn't better than their receiving core last year mm-hmm. when they had. And, and yes, they both lost two guys, but the difference is is. Alabama lost all their starters. Alabama, Ohio State lost two, and the guy they have coming back had more production than those other studs. Now, part of it's because yeah. those teams, you know, he was able to get a lot of single matchups, but I, I, I can't buy I can't buy Bama being number one. But you look at the group. I'd ha- I have no beef with Notre Dame not being in the top ten right now, even with Michael Mayer. And, and I think you could maybe make a case like some of these groups at the bottom, like Houston. You know, Wake Forest has some good players coming back. Here's the thing I'll say, though, Ryan. Mm-hmm. If you're going to put Michigan sixth, then Notre Dame should be in the top ten. That That's my thing. Yeah, because, yeah, I mean, Michigan has Eric All coming back, right? They have it's a tight lot ends. of bodies. Yeah, they have a lot of guys. They have a lot of names. They have like Cornelius right. Johnson and um, Andrell Anthony. like Roman, I, Roman Wilson, Mike Sainstrill. Um, Donnie, Bell, Donnie, Ronnie Bell. Ronnie Bell comes back from injury. Yep. Yep. Andrell Anthony did, some, did okay down the stretch, but it's like – um, yeah, I mean Lorenzo Styles basically has similar to production in all their receivers other than Cornelius Johnson last year. Mm-hmm. And with all due respect, to Eric All, and I did not mean that to, uh, to sound like it did. None of those guys are in the same universe as Michael Mayer as a player. I well, mean, I mean, I, if we're, if, I mean, if we're being honest, and this is not a biased thing at all, Michael Mayer combined just with Lorenzo Styles, what he did as a freshman should be over Houston. I know yes. they had Nathaniel Dell, who was a good football player, but sure. like, come on, man. Like, let's be honest sure. here. Wake Forest had another, they're another one that's a really one good wide receiver, A.T. Right. Perry. He's a really good player. There's no right. doubt. But I mean, Michael Mayer was the best tight end. Jakari Robertson, is he coming back? He's gone. NFL. So, yeah. So that's would be my yep. question. That would be yep. Taylor Moran's a good player, but again, that's a lot of young guy projection. And let's be honest, if Lorenzo Styles played at Wake Forest last year, not at Notre Dame, he would have had the production that those other guys had coming back. Yep. And, and so that's kind of that's kind of my point with this is is if you're gonna put Michigan like just in theory, without looking at who's in there, mm-hmm. in theory, I'm okay with Notre Dame not being in the top 10. Mm-hmm. Where I have an issue is when you start looking at actually who they have in the top 10. 
And then it's like, okay, I don't understand this one. I, I one that pops out to me is I think Maryland should be over Michigan. They have the yes. Demas kid and the Rakeem Jarrett kid both yes. coming back from Maryland. I think they should yes. be over Michigan. I didn't realize that Jacob Copeland transferred in there either. Yes, yes, who's, who's a talented pick. player yeah. that was hindered by a Florida offense over the last couple Correct. of years. Yep. Yeah, I definitely don't have them. And then Georgia coming back, I thought that's all based on their tight ends. I mean, it has to be because their receiving core situation is not exactly, yeah, in they my have opinion, like, like super sexy. At this, they have Kiris Kiris Johnson and their. Right. I, I mean, Jackson Kiris Jackson and who wasn't I think, healthy last year. Who wasn't healthy? I think Eric right. Gilbert's going to play wide receiver for him. Like he's not going to play tight end. I don't think. Yeah, right. I know. right. I mean, Lad McConkey was their number. Th- two pass catcher last year behind Who's solid who solid right i mean if right. you're trying to build your 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 top five pass catcher resume around him uh you know i'm not sure and the other one is i thought virginia being in the top five was a little was a stretch as well i don't know the man they got some dudes the they got some dudes there but i'm yeah, not putting them in the top five i'm not fair i think that's more of a byproduct of of who because here's the thing look at what happened when they played notre dame without the quarterback Sure. They did nothing. Nothing. Mm-hmm. If you've got dudes at receiver, a quarter, a decent quarterback should at least be able to get you more than three points against a good defense, right? Sure. And it's not like Notre Dame had their 2018 defense last year. They did nothing when you took him out of that game. And they played a team with a real defense. That's the other thing is like, yeah, you know, you finally played a team with a real defense and look what happened, right? And that was it. Miami is another one too that I thought like they kind of got exposed a little bit as being system guys because Miami had some athletes and they kind of, you know, they ended up winning the game. Miami choked it away, but I just I thought it was more system driven. You know, again, good college football players. Mm-hmm. And what's the name of the kid that I really like? You know, what I'm talking about the outside Dante, kid, Dante Vian Wicks. Yes, yes, yeah. I like him good a player. lot. He's a good know, player. Katoan Thompson's a nice player, but again, last year he had matchups against Notre Dame that you're thinking a kid with his ability should be able to take advantage of. They and do have – um, they do, do it, you know? one thing that bu- buoys them a little bit is they do have Lavelle Davis coming back from injury. The, he's like the yep. six seven skyscraper that yeah. averaged like 25 to catch right. as, as a freshman or something. Yeah, I mean, oh. we'll see. I think, it. you know, again, they, Jelani Woods was a, a nice player for them. You know, uh, Bill, Billy Kemp's not coming back for them, is he? Billy Kemp is coming he's back. Coming back. Yeah. He's really yeah. like, is he like their version of Hunter Renfro? Dude, I, he's got to be a six-year senior, yeah, right? Yeah, that freaking be. old. He's been around yeah. for a minute. He sure has. Um, yeah, he's been around for a while. So, yeah, he's – shoot, goodness gracious. So, again, good players, but I'm just like, am I putting them ahead of Maryland? I mean, just pr- the talent in the room? Like, whose roster would you rather have? I think it's a debatable. I think it's debatable. I, and that's mm-hmm. the whole point is I don't know if I would love them. Now, here's the bigger question, Ryan. Yep. Where can Notre Dame get to? That And then what needs to happen for, for them to get there? With, with- – I mean, with with tight end in the conversation, obviously, at least in the Lindy side of things, right? Like, I'd say they can get to five. Like, I'm I'm just they can get to four or five. I think okay. so. I think. I mean, one so thing just you, looking at this group. Yes. Right? Yes. Like, I I mean, I again, Alabama, Ohio State, mm-hmm. USC. After that, I think is going to be a really dynamic team. Yep. After that, though, I can make an argument that if, at their peak, four or five is very attainable. I think. I if, think USC should be ahead of Alabama right now. If we're being honest, sure. And they got yeah. the Belitnikov winner coming, but now I mean, there's the cohesiveness. Mario Williams is coming back. He's better than yep. anybody Alabama has coming back, mm-hmm. right? I mean, they don't have a ton of depth, but that two duo right there to me is better than anything Alabama has. I mean, to me, I would have it: Ohio State one, USC two. It's fair. If we're just talking pass catchers, I, yeah, they have, they have the they have the Bryant kid on the team still. Right. Gary What's Bryant. it, Gary Bryant? Right. Yeah, just and solid now player. he's in a role where he's their three or four, which mm-hmm. then is more conducive to what type of player he is. He take you know take some of that pressure off. So yes, I, 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 I mean, just looking at this group based on where they are, I mean, there's no reason I don't think they could get to four. A lot has to go right, right. But when you have the best tight end in college football, if if you know that's what we believe at, at Irish Breakdown. Mm-hmm. It's certainly possible. I mean, if Georgia's going to get the five with just tight ends, I mean, Notre Dame should be able to be in that kind of conversation. And I would argue that Notre Dame's returning receiver situation is better than Georgia's returning receiver situation, in my opinion. Because especially with Kyrus Jackson's injury history. I mean, he's got a lot of production, but I'm not trading him for Lorenzo Styles. Mm-hmm. You know, so now Notre Dame's got a lot to prove, right? That's the big thing here. It's a lot like the running back position. 
right now with Notre Dame, this argument outside of Mayer, it's all projection, right? Um, with the exception of Mayer and Avery Davis. And that's where I think Notre Dame's receiving core is not getting enough respect. They're not getting – Avery Davis is not getting enough respect for what he's done the last two years and the kind of player he has been. And not just numbers-wise, but look at the moments in which Avery has had his best games. Mm-hmm. Right, he's made his biggest plays. It's been clutch moments. I mean, making a huge play at the end of the Clemson game to send that game two huge plays against Clemson on that final drive to tie the game up. Yeah, I think they have a shot to get there. There's a long road between here and there. Long road. Braden Lindsay's got to stay healthy. That that's sure. that's number one. Somebody's got to emerge in the boundary, and and it can't be Lorenzo full time. Somebody's got to step up and and be able to play there. Whether it's Colsey, Jaden Thomas, Tobias Merriweather. The problem with Notre Dame is the depth is such a big question mark right now that yep. it's like a couple injuries and, and it's a problem. And then also a tight end, somebody's got to emerge as the number two tight end. So that's what I'm saying. Like right now, I'm I'm totally fine with Notre Dame not being a top 10 group. I'd say probably what around like 15 to 18 is, is right now probably where maybe, where you'd have them maybe. Maybe even a little higher. I might say 12 to, 12 to 15 maybe, somewhere in that mm-hmm. ballpark. Yeah. Now, and I'm looking at this list. They had to have – they had to – hold on a second. Let me see here. All right, so USC third. There's no mention of Jordan Addison in this. So I gotta probably, think this was, it was written probably before. printed. Yeah, yeah right. I gotta right. think this was written before that. And then they mm-hmm. had Pitt ranked number six in Athlon. Again, that has to be with Jordan Addison. So that's right. another thing to factor into with these groups. Athlon's was even worse. They had Georgia number two. Oh, that's absurd. <laughs> that is that is you're hoping that Eric Gilbert is a dude yes, in conversation yes. right there. Yeah. Right. Like when was the last time a team that didn't have any legit one or two number one or two receivers but had two great tight ends was that kind of team? Come on. Right. That's yeah. No, that's that's I, I think for Notre Dame to get there though, Brian, I, I do think that they have an opportunity to get the four or five just based mm-hmm. upon this list. Michael Mayer is a known thing, right? Like you're, right. you're going to, he's going to be a dude. There's no doubt about that. Barring an injury or yep. some unforeseen thing like that. But you need, I really think you need Avery at least. needs to also be, I mean, yeah, I'm going to let you, but yep. I think you have two known commodities. If he's healthy, you right. know what Michael Mayer is. He's a dude, but you also know what Avery Davis is, which is a really good, steady slot player. That's will blow you away with big time production, but he's a good football player now. Yep. Cause I yes. think you and I are going to be on the same page with what's next. So please, Please continue with what else needs to happen. You need a dude at receiver. So I, in my opinion, that should be Lorenzo Styles. You mm-hmm. need him to be the guy, right? Like he needs right. to be your go-to wide receiver. And then you need Avery Davis and the rest and the rest of the receiving core to be good, solid contributors to your passing mm-hmm. game. So I think you have a dude at tight end. You need one absolute dude at wide receiver, and you need a bunch of consistent good as the rest of the other spots. That's mm-hmm. what I see as you need it. Agree. I think I think Lorenzo has to step up because I think Braden Lindsay is key to this thing too. I think Braden Lindsay might be even more important than Lorenzo, and I'm going to make this argument why. If Lorenzo steps up and is a dude this year, I'm talking like fifty to sixty catches, eight to nine hundred yards. Like because again, he's sharing. You know, he's sharing t- running game. You know, dude, meaning he's a matchup problem, not dude is in like 90 catches for 1400 yards. I'm talking about where you just got to, def- you've got to have a game plan for him. 60, 60, let's say 50 to 60 catches minimum, eight to 900 yards minimum, seven, eight touchdowns, like great number two compliment to Michael Mayer. He's that dude. That's great. But I would say you could, you could say if Lorenzo's just good and Avery's just good. And Deion Colsey and Jane Thomas come and Tobias Merriweather as a trio are just good. That's a really good receiving core, right? Like that's a top 10 group. But my, I would always go back to, but what could really launch into that upper stratosphere is if Braden Lindsay can be healthy and get back to the guy he was in 2019. If you can give this offense a guy that only needs 30 to 40 touches the whole year, and I'm talking total touches, I'd say 40 to 50 total touches. That means reverses, uh, jet sweeps. You know, all that stuff, which is what we saw from him in 2019. He only had 40 touches in 2019. Or excuse me, he only had 20 touches in 2019. Let's just say he doubles that because he plays the whole year, okay? He has 35 to 40 touches. That's it. You're talking about a guy that's going to have eight to 800 to 1,000 yards of production on 40 touches. 
with the kind of player that he can be. If he can be that guy, that's the key. Mm-hmm. Now, you don't have that dude, but I would argue if Lorenzo's just solid and Avery's solid and, and that other group is solid and Mayer's a stud and you have this home run hitter over here, that's going to make Styles better. It's going to make Avery better. It's Because you can't – if you've got to worry about every time Braden, Braden Lindsay's on the field for him running it, running by you, because again, he's not going to be an 80 catch guy. That's not his game, right? He's not, oh, he's not Will Fuller. They have different games. But if Braden can be a 40 touch guy that's averaging 20 plus a touch with Chris Tyree and Jadarian Price and Audric Estime, and hopefully a, at some point a healthy Logan Diggs with a type of runner that Tyler Buckner is, that is that final piece that could make this Notre Dame offense special. And I think that's the one thing, even with Lorenzo, I don't know if I view Lorenzo as that type of player. I think Lorenzo can be a big play, big, a big play guy, but I don't know if he's that guy that you're always worried about him running by you, if that makes sense. Like Lorenzo to me, and and, and please understand where I'm going with this. If we're talking about types of players, you know, there's there's Will Fuller. And then there's Devontae Smith, right? Stylistically, I think Lorenzo is more Devontae Smith than Will Fuller. Devontae Smith could beat you over top, but he didn't make his living running by you. You you know what I mean, Ryan? Like now, again, I'm not saying Lorenzo is Devontae Smith or Will Fuller. I'm just comparing using a a, a well-known type of player to say Devontae Smith, Will Fuller, similar production, right? If you project out Will Fuller two extra games like Devontae had in a different offense, but very di- got to it very differently. And then Will Fuller's not as good as Devontae Smith. You guys understand the, the point that I'm making here. Yep. Lorenzo is more of a Devontae Smith in a route runner, you know, take short plays and turn them long. Occasionally can run by you. But Devontae Smith didn't make his living. Now the first big play he ever made was a vertical route, right? But he didn't make his living with just running posts and goes all day, like Henry Ruggs did. He was a Guy knows how to get open. He's working himself free. He's catching the ball at 15, 20 yards and then making doing damage, right? Right. And that to me is is more Lorenzo, where Braden Lindsay's that guy that your safeties better be aware of him on every single play. And if they're worried about him, how are they defending Michael Mayer? How are they <laughs> defending Lorenzo? How are they defending Chris Tyree? How are they defending Buckner out of the backfield? Do you know what I mean? And so that's why I say, even though there's a case where where Braden Lindsay could be the third or fourth most productive pass catcher, he could have the biggest game plan impact on the entire roster. And I'll say this too. I think that's especially true in the opener against Ohio state. Cause who's the one guy that Ohio state's not going to be spending all summer saying, we got to make sure that guy doesn't beat us. It's going to be brain Lindsay. Yeah. They're going to be worried about Avery Davis on third down. They're going to be worried about mayor. They're going to be worried about Lorenzo because of what they've proven. The one guy that they're not going to be like, Hey, let's have a game plan for number zero. That's not, it's not who that'll be his chance. To say, okay, single cover me. All right, cool. Mm-hmm. Put yeah. this guy, put Cameron Brown on me one on one, please. You know, um, and I think that's where you could see even early on he could have that impact. Potent- potential first round pick, Cameron Brown. Is that who you're oh talking about? <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, I had to throw that in there. Yeah, man. you I did. Just trying to fire me up today. You know, you know, someone just reminded me in the chat there, Brian. You know, there's another team that's an interesting team to maybe be in the top ten, at least close, mm-hmm. is South Carolina with. Um, they had Austin Stogner transfer in from Oklahoma. Mm-hmm. They have Jaheim Bell at tight end last year, who's a really talented player mm-hmm. coming back. They had Josh Van at wide receiver, who's a good football player as well. Yeah. So just you yeah. know, another another team to think about. Uh, on yeah, I don't know, man. Can Stogner uh, fill the shoes of your boy Nick Muse? I don't know. I love I Nick Muse, know. man. I, I have a soft spot for Nick Muse. He was such yeah, a solid I just, player. My thing is, I just don't know who their who their second receiver is going to be. That's fair. But I'll say this: they're going to have. You look at like Josh Van, for example. I didn't know he was coming back. He was a senior last year. That COVID thing is a beautiful thing. Yes, it is. Um, Josh Van's a nice player. I like him. But the thing that hurt him last year is, I mean, they were a hot mess at quarterback, man. And sure were. Spencer Rattler is, like, he's walking in such a different dynamic. Before it was like, hey, are you the next Kyler Murray? Are you the next, you know, Baker Mayfield? And now it's like, please be better than Luke Doty. Please be better than Jason Brown. Please, please be better than the guy that we brought in because we were going to have him be a coach and had to turn him into a player. Oh you know man, I mean? you mean you mean the you mean the 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 assistant coach turned quarterback who <laughs> lost his starting job at North Dakota State? <laughs> that guy exactly. Oh, that guy started games for South Carolina. Zeb Noland, man, what a you legend! Know, so what a legend. he's walking into such a different dynamic now. 
And here's the funny thing. He was their best quarterback last year. <laughs> That's the even sadder part. Yeah. I mean, look, seven touchdowns, one interception, seven yards, 7.3 yards per attempt, better than all the other quarterbacks they had. So That's now true. Spencer Rattler doesn't have to be that Heisman Trophy winner, number one quarterback to, to, to help his team win. He just needs to be – just be yourself. Just just make the plays that can get you there. Just run the offense. When you get a chance to make a play, make a play. Mm-hmm. And I think that's going to be the key. And, and and so now here's the thing I will add to this about Michigan. And I made the comment earlier about Michigan. The one thing that could change this a little bit is if J.J. McCarthy is able to get healthy and win the starting quarterback job. Because I think if you can add a dynamic athlete at quarterback, and I think J.J. McCarthy is, is, is not the – he's not Tyler Buckner as an athlete – He's got a big arm and he, can, and he is athletic. If mm-hmm. you can add that element to the to the running to the quarterback position, it's going to help their playmakers because they don't have to be dudes per se. Because mm-hmm. now you have a quarterback that can actually make can raise your level of play up. So part of my I'm not sure I'm buying Michigan at six thing comes from the thought of Cade McNamara still being the starting quarterback. But even still, I still believe Notre Dame has more potential than Michigan does simply because Michigan has got way more proven production. But if everybody plays to their potential, there's nobody at Michigan that I'm trading for Lorenzo Styles. There's nobody at Michigan that I'm trading for Michael Mayer. Nobody. There's nobody at Michigan that I'm trading for Tobias Merriweather with all due respect to their young receivers. So the, uh, and I would make the case for Deion Colsey as well. So the God-given talent in Notre Dame is better, but the difference is Michigan's got a lot of dudes that have caught passes sure. and in big moments. And I think that's the difference for me. So um, those are some of the caveats. But I do I do think I would say probably more comfortably in the bottom five, everything would have to go right for Notre Dame to get in the top five. For sure. Me. You know, uh, but the potential's there. It's just I'm more confident that some of the other groups are going to get into it as, than, than maybe I am at that position, just because there's so much to prove. So much to prove. In you know who's a, t- a weird team that's in the top that I just noticed? I didn't even notice. Oklahoma at number eight. Yeah. Do they have anything ba- coming back besides Marvin Mims? I mean, Stock- Stockner transferred, right? Mario Williams transferred. Yeah. Uh, do they have uh, – Mike Woods went into the draft last yeah. year. Do they have anything they else? Hazelwood didn't do a whole lot for them last year. Right. They did get some grad transfers. Let me, let me, let me look at that. They did get some guys to transfer in. Let me – let me look at who that is. And it, like, they also lost, they had a really good freshman receiving core projected to show up. And then they like Luther burden flipped to Missouri and yep. they lost some of those guys. Let me see who they got. I thought they had a couple like grad transfers I know, coming in. I know they got, they, they got Dylan Gabriel, the quarterback from UCF, right? Yeah. I, yeah. I, I kind of like got, Gabriel a little bit as far as the college the, quarterback goes. But. They got the kid with the best quarterback name in the country. Um, oh, um, General booty. Yeah. There you go. <laughs> they did get JV on Hester. From Missouri, he transferred in. Uh, let's see here. He had JJ Hester. He had twelve catches for two hundred twenty-five yards. He's a big play guy, big, 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 big play guy. Uh, LV Sh- Bunkley Shelton from Arizona State transferred in. Okay. Uh, I thought the other receiver was better to me, in my opinion. Um, Pearsall was a better player, but. You know, he oh, played yeah. last year, played 12 games, had 33 catches, 418 yards. Uh, he transferred in. Where, where did where did Pearsall end up? He was actually a decent player for Arizona State. He's not a bad little That's player. That's a good question. I honestly do not know. Gotcha. I, I honestly do not know. I'd have to go look. I, did he make a decision? I thought he did. I thought he did transfer somewhere. Okay. I could be wrong. Though. Was Ricky, Ricky, Ricky right? right? Ricky Pearsall, yeah. 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 He's a good, he was a good player. Let's see, where he, let's see where he ended up. He supposedly he, runs okay. in like the Florida? Okay. Florida. He yeah. supposedly runs in like the high four threes, apparently. Someone told yeah. me. So yeah. yeah, we'll see. So I mean they they had some decent players transfer in, but I'm I'm not I'm not buying the the top ten thing. I think there's some other groups that should should be in there. I do like Marvin Mims, but yeah. you know. Yep. Yep. So uh there we go, Ryan. I think that kind of wraps it up. We did have a few questions here uh that we can pull up, Ryan, if you want to kind of go through and see if there's any more while we're yep. doing this. Sounds good. That'll be interesting here. All right. A lot, of, a lot of conference versus conference talk in the chat. Yep. Today. Hulk Strongest said, I wish Lawrence Keyes would have stayed. Me too. Uh, did he leave because of Kelly or Dell or Tommy Reese? That was a Dell thing, 100% a Dell issue there. I don't get too much into it because it's what's done is done and they're all gone, but that was a Dell issue. That was a lack of communication and a lack of trust. 
Notre Dame 216 form. I'm sure you guys have already talked about this, but in the past, in the past, but I know I need to know how Notre Dame corner recruiting got as bad as it did during the Kelly era. Notre Dame uh, having to start a true freshman at corner is he's not happy. I think there's a lot of different reasons for it. I think number one is there were some bad evaluations. I mean, Clark Lee saying, nope, I would rather have Caleb Offord over Clark uh, Phillips because Caleb Offord has much better wingspan and the the traits that we're looking for physically. He's tall. He's got very long arms and all that. Uh, yeah, I know Clark Phillips is a really good player on film, but he's too small. Mm-hmm. There's a lot of things like that. Let's be honest about that. The other thing that hurt him was the 2016 season. I mean, if we're being honest about that, Notre Dame had Paulson Adebo committed. They would have probably lost him anyway because as soon as Stanford took him, he was going to be gone. But they had Elijah um, Elijah Hicks, the kid that started at, uh, at Cal the last few years. They had him committed. And Thomas Graham was a silent commit to Notre Dame. And had they wow. not completely had they not completely screwed up his of his in home visit, he probably still would have signed with Notre Dame. Uh, so and you know, then after that, you you've had some bad luck, some injuries, some mis a lot of, but I think a lot of it's just misevaluations, and and then just flat out bad recruiting. And look, you can't just send your cornerbacks coach to get top players and not have a dynamic defensive coordinator and not have a head coach that's involved in recruiting. It's just, it was a, a bunch of different things, but I think, look, I think Mike Mickens has shown what kind of corner recruiting you can have on a consistent basis. If you have a coach that is willing to put in the work and a defensive coordinator that's willing to do the same thing. And, and even without that, he at, at, at Notre Dame in his first year, he got Ryan Barnes, he got Philip Riley, he got, you know, uh, chance Tucker, and so I think he had a good first year without him being able to go on the road. And then this, you know how I feel about this past year's quarterback class, Ryan. You know, you Benjamin Morrison, Jaden Mickey. And then yep. if Notre Dame is able to land Micah Bell and Christian Gray a year after getting Benjamin Morrison and Jaden Mickey, I start feeling really good about the future of the quarterback position. But, you know, right. Todd Light was not a dynamic recruiter. He wasn't. He needed to have a staff around him to help. Because, again, partly he'd never done it before. He never coached before like that. He'd never been a recruiter before. D coordinator who wasn't a great recruiter after Elko left and then Kelly being not involved. And like I said, there were some bad evaluations. I I think I, Oh, and the other thing, Landon Bartleson getting arrested also hurt. uh, I liked him a lot. I liked him a lot. And he would, he would be a rising junior this year. He was a Kentucky kid, right? Yeah. When he got arrested, because he was my favorite DB in that class, favorite corner recruit in that class. When he got arrested, that really hurt their cornerback recruiting as well. Because I I liked that kid a lot, and I think this would be the year he'd be kind of growing into his own. Because you know, he was a kind of a running back athlete kind of corner, he'd have needed some time. So, yeah, yeah, yeah. It's, I, gonna, it's gonna be interesting. I think misevaluations is probably the biggest one, just from the stories that I've heard. Right, like you mentioned, you mentioned um, Clark Phillips. Obviously, Clark Phillips the third, who's now a really good cornerback out of Utah. We've talked about the George Karloftis thing, right? Not thinking he's yeah. flexible enough. We've talked about AJ Dillon, them thinking he's a linebacker. I like found that, found that evaluation. Remember, I sent that to you. So yes, yep, 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 yep. So yep, those are uh, those aren't great. Not every great. staff's going to have those, right? Every staff's going to have those misevaluations. But it just at that, I think that happened a little bit too much at times at corner. Just because I think, as, as again, love Coach Lee, but I just think he was a little bit too, I'll say narrow minded, but I'll say it narrow minded. I don't, because I just don't, for lack of a better term, he was so dead set on traits. You know, and what I mean by traits, I'm talking like real ones, not like the Brian Kelly, like let's just use this Trump word traits. I'm talking like real evaluation trait, six one, long arms, like those kind of things. I think that caused him to make a lot of bad evaluations, in my opinion. And and like like even like Ramon Henderson, now he's turning out to have a chance to be a really good safety, but he wasn't a corner because he was a track guy. But you can't keep bringing in guys like that and not anyone who you, like okay, you want to bring in Caleb Offord and Ramon Henderson because you like the traits. Fine, Bount, counter that with a Clark Phillips who maybe doesn't have the traits, but's a really good football player. And I think those are the things that 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 need to be done to improve it. And I think that's what got them where they are. Because like imagine if they didn't sign Cam Hart as a receiver. Imagine if Chip Long didn't go get him. That's the funny thing is, like, sometimes some of the last seven, eight years, like, some of the best defensive players Notre Dame has had were recruited by offensive coaches. You can go back to Jerry Tillery, right? Uh, now Cam Hart. It, th- think how screwed Notre Dame would be right now in secondary if, if they if Cam Hart doesn't switch positions. And he was rec- – I mean, think about it. Their best corner was recruited by their, their former offensive coordinator. 
So yeah, it's 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 even worse than than we think <laughs> in some ways. I mean, yeah. and same thing twenty twenty. If Nick McLeod doesn't transfer in, they're they're screwed in twenty twenty. Oh yeah, him transferring in was huge for Notre Dame. Sure was, was huge for Notre Dame. He was rock solid for them. Oh yeah, yeah very. And he brought some maturity, some leadership, you know, that they just did would not have had. Salty Virginia Peanuts is recruiting question. Mm-hmm. Do you think that having Carr in place for 2024 and willing to recruit and nobody in place in 2023 at quarterback makes 2024 top talent more worthy of focus? As in their ability to accumulate top talent because the quarterback's in the class? Is that is that what this is asking Yeah, me? I think it's kind of like maybe the recruiting staff focusing more on – Oh, gotcha. I mean, yeah, it definitely. I think it definitely helps. I mean, anytime you get a talent like that, especially at a position like quarterback, because everybody knows how important quarterback is. And also the fact of the matter is that you're usually only going to take one quarterback in a cycle, right? So you're you're done for 2024. Mm-hmm. So now all your focus is purely on let's the rest of the class, right? Like we don't have to worry about quarterback. You just have to keep in touch right. with CJ and keep that relationship solid and you don't have to recruit anybody else. So yeah, I think that that is definitely going to help. And then Anytime you have a quarterback, we've talked this a lot about the Dante Moore thing, the CJ Carr thing. Anytime you have a quarterback in early and he becomes now a big recruiter, which all indications say CJ Carr has right. already done, but by his oh, impact yeah. just this past weekend. Right. Yes, I think that 2024 you have massive upside. I, but I th- also think that CJ is helpful with 2023 a little bit. So it's mm-hmm. good, just good to have him in general for Notre Dame. Salty Virginia Peanuts also asks, Ryan, from your conversation with the great one, do you feel there's any sign of him trending away, or is he honestly just not ready but is still tight on Notre Dame? I think he's referring to Jaden Greathouse. Um, I mean, after my conversation, I think Notre Dame is still in the driver's seat, I guess we'll put it that way. Like, I I, I would – I still think that Notre Dame is – Notre Dame is the top school for Jaden Greathouse right now, I would say. The, the uneasiness is – the longer you leave it open, the more opportunity for other teams to come into the conversation, right? And to get back into the game or get into the game or whatever it would be. So I think that it's, I don't think he's trending away. No, I just think that there's, it's just a different dynamic as far as how you need to attack this recruitment now. Mm-hmm. So I think that changes. All right, let's, uh, let's get to the, I, I, I think that I also think, I know he's coming the weekend thing. He's going to post to delay, but it doesn't mean that that's, how he's going to feel coming out of the weekend. Right. Would, would be my stance. John Murray asks, speaking of cornerbacks, Ryan and Ryan, what are the odds that Ryan Barnes breaks into the starting lineup? I I mean, I look, I, I've been very open and honest about this one. I think if Notre Dame has its best opportunity to be a very good secondary in 2022 on an all-around perspective, I think it's because Ryan Bur- Brian Barnes takes that step forward and he becomes that guy that also allows you to unlock Clarence Lewis a little bit and kind of use him in a variety of ways. So I think he's going to play a lot regardless, but I'm going to say, yes, I think eventually he is breaking into the starting because I think that his talent level is just that of kind of, uh, I don't want to say one upping, but mm-hmm. taking the starting knot at some point, we'll leave it at yeah. that. I guess maybe more wishful thinking with no disrespect towards Clarence Lewis. It's not personal. I just, it's more about what I think. Mm-hmm. the talent that Ryan Barnes brings to the table. Coach Br- Bent, 574, should we be worried about Hannafin going to Bama since ESPN has him rated higher than 24-7 arrival? No. <laughs> That's funny. That's funny. No. <laughs> Just to give everybody a heads up, obviously, uh, Ronan Hannafin, I believe, uh, no, I didn't mention this yesterday here because I wasn't on the show yesterday, but I, I ne- mentioned it on the board briefly. I'll have another update on it probably tomorrow, but I do expect Ronan Hannafin to still take his visits that he had planned which would include an Alabama visit this weekend and a Boston College visit before he makes a decision. We told you all a couple weeks ago that Ronan's plan was probably to make a decision late June, early July. I still anticipate that being the the time frame. Probably late June is when I'm first going to start looking. But uh, with everything that I've been able to gather, I'm um, uh, we feel good about Notre it. Notre Dame's in a good place. I'm just trying <laughs> yeah. to do this the right way. Notre Dame's in a good place, but. Uh, you know, I think it says a lot about about Ronan Hannafin that that he's being recruited by. I mean, his top three is Clemson, Notre Dame, and Alabama. It's crazy. And Nick Saban has personally taken over his recruitment. I think that says everything you need to know about the kind of athlete that Ronan Hannafin is. Best and, three star of all time. Yeah, <laughs> still absurd. <laughs> You're so correct. Matt, 2011 GT, Freeman handled it very well. This is kind of going back to the original conversation, which, by the way, will also be discussed tonight in the 
IB Nation Sports Talk Show. I guarantee you, uh, I know this because I talked to Sean about it. Uh, him and Vince will have some opinions tonight on the whole situation as well, which I'm very interested to see because you know Sean comes at this at such a different place than I do. I'm very, you know, I'll be tuning in, Ryan, at six o'clock Eastern. By yep. the way, uh, Freeman handled it very well. In my opinion, this whole thing is a non-issue. I agree. And just again, proof Freeman is a high character guy. Clowns gonna clown, and you are Agreed. absolutely right about that. Ryan uh, James Lawrence Zensi said, "Did Kane Madden uh, even uh, get signed yet anywhere?" Yeah, he didn't get signed initially as a priority kid, but I'm pretty sure he got signed by the Giants at, at least on a camp invite basis. So I, I believe he is with the New York Giants currently. You know, Kane took a lot of flack last year, and he took it in stride, and he took it like a man. And I hope the kid does well. I do. I have no issue with Kane Madden personally. I, from, from all accounts, he's a good kid and hard worker. My issue was had more to do with those around him in the decision makers. Lucas Chapman, do you think Tyler Buckner is going to be very hard to sack this year? I, I, I mean, yeah. I mean, that, there's a couple of ways that you look at that, right? I mean, one, Lucas, it's dependent upon how good is the offensive line takes massive steps forward, right? Are they able to? handle pressure and maybe even different pressure situations. But I mean, if Notre Dame's offensive line is playing well, I would say yes, because one, if there's not a ton of free rushers, that's great. But also Tyler Buckner's a strong kid, man. He's going to shrug off some sacks. So yeah, I think he'll be a, I think he'll be a, a tough kid to sack just in a one-on-one perspective. I mean, cause he's that type of strong athlete, right? Like he's explosive mm -hmm. in that way. Mm-hmm. Patrick Quinn, though, with a super chat. Thank you, Patrick, for that very much. If I told you right now that Ohio State scores exactly 35 points, do you feel better or worse about Notre Dame's chances to win compared to, to total being unknown? That would actually make it the hardest to determine whether they would or wouldn't win. I think the number you gave, Patrick, is the the worst. Because, like, I, okay, does Notre Dame win 38-35? Do they lose 35-31? to 31? Right. It, You know, like, 35 is like, yeah, that's the one that I probably have the least amount of certainty on. It's a tough number. It's yeah. A tough number. Yeah. yeah. Uh, but look, we we pointed this out. I can't tell you the last time Ohio State scored in the 30s and lost. I mean, we went through this a couple weeks ago. And and every – I mean, we can quickly do it again if y'all want to, but here's the amount of points that Ohio State has scored in all the losses in, in several years. They scored 28 against Oregon, 27 against Michigan this past year. The year before, they scored 24 in a loss to Bama. 2019, they scored 23 in a loss to Clemson. 2018, they scored 20 in a loss to Purdue. 2017, they scored 16 in a loss to Oklahoma, 24 in a loss to Iowa. 2016, they scored 21 in a loss to Penn State, zero in a loss to Clemson. Mm -hmm. 2015, they scored 14 in a loss to Michigan State, 2014. They scored, and 2013 is the last time they that I'm, I'm confident that they did. 2014, they had a 21 point, scored 21 in a loss to, to Virginia Tech the year they won a title. And then 2013, they scored 24 in a loss to Michigan State, 35 in a bowl game loss to Clemson. Mm -hmm. uh, 2012, undefeated, no postseason, if you remember correctly. And then 2011, they scored 34 in a loss to Michigan. So from 2012 on, that's what, 10 whole seasons, right? They had exactly one game that they scored over 30 points and lost. So if I'm just looking at trends, then I'd say 35 points would make me not feel great about winning that game just great because stat. of what we've seen, right? Mm -hmm. So uh, I would not feel good. But is it a winnable game at 35? Yeah, because, again, they, they, they you know, you pointed a Clemson game and, and Michigan game. It's, it's happened, but it doesn't happen a lot. I think to beat Ohio State, you've got to keep them in the 20s. That's – that's the MO. Now, there's a lot of games they've won in the 20s, but every single loss they've had, and again, they haven't lost a ton of games, but going all the way back to 2012, every game they've lost, with exception of, of, of a bowl game, they've they've scored, if they've scored in the 30s or more, they they 30 or more, they win. That's just the reality of it. Mm -hmm. So I think you're going to have to try to hold them under that, which means turnovers and stop, sacks and stops and stuff like that. So that would be my answer, but it's a good question, Patrick. Blaine Tiller. Who do you think will finish the season ranked higher nationally? Notre Dame wide receiver group or Notre Dame secondary? Ooh, that's a good question. 
secondary for me because I think when I looked at the secondary list, I, I wasn't as impressed with the quality of depth to that spot because, I mean, that one had, at least in Lindy's, it had Ohio State at number five, which we've continued to talk about. Their secondary was not good last year, right? So, and um, they actually had Notre Dame at four in the Lindy's list from a defensive back perspective. I think if Cam Hart takes a step and he's a guy – and Brandon Joseph's the player that we think he can be, and everybody else around them is just good, then I would expect them to be one of the top five secondaries in the in the college football next year, right? And I think that there's a possibility for the wide receivers to get somewhere in the same ballpark, but I just I think there's more known commodities in the secondary than there is at the wide receiver tight end position. You have one absolute known in a Michael Mayer at a high, uh, like a high value, right? But then you also have Cam Hart, and Brandon Joseph, I think, could still also be one of the better players of their positions in college football. So I'll go with the secondary. Yeah, I think it has more to do with – I think the, the point that I will grab onto, Ryan, and, and, and discuss just briefly because I think you nailed it, it's, it's also partly about what's around them, right? Like you could have – you could have a better secondary. You could have a better receiving core than you have a secondary, and still rank lower nationally at that one because if there's other really strong groups, it's like the draft. You know, this past year, you could be the number one defensive tackle in a draft, and you're not going in the first round, right? Am I correct that there was not a pure defensive tackle taken in the first round? Right, there was the nose guard Jordan Davis, right? But I'm talking like D tackle, like three technique, right? Devonte Devonte Wyatt went like 28 Did he go or something, 28? yeah, yeah, something right. Like and, yeah. and so you could be the number one running back in a class and not go in the first round, right? So That's just fair. because you're yeah. number one at a position doesn't necessarily mean that you're going to be, you know, you could be. I mean, I'm trying to think of some of the positions here, like what the fifth, put it like this: the sixth or seventh defensive end got drafted higher, I believe, than the number two defensive tackle. Mm -hmm. Right, three technique and if uh, number three defensive tackle because we'll put we'll just lump the interior guys together like we do defensive ends. So the number six or seven defensive end is getting drafted higher than the number three defensive tackle, right? Right, and we mm -hmm. saw that at quarterback a couple years ago, right? Like the you know you just this is the reality of it, right? Like the number five quarterback or number four. So number four because you had you had Fields, you had tr no number five, the number five quarterback in two thousand twenty one draft. 115th overall was yeah. drafted higher than the number one running back. Correct. Uh -huh. Yep. Yep. So, Najee, Najee went like 24 and Mac Jones went right. 15 to the Patriots. Yep. So that's just kind of part of it is, is, is that's what makes it difficult to say what, you know, who's going to rank higher. I, I do agree with Ryan. I think there's potential for more pass catching groups that I like this year than necessarily a bunch of secondaries that I like, but I, I do think that Notre Dame fans have too negative of a view of the secondary. And 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 you, you and I get why it's recency bias. What's the last thing we saw was the secondary looking terrible against Oklahoma State, right? Sure. Bowl games are different. That's a different coaching staff. That's not how bad the secondary was all year. And you didn't have Kyle Hamilton or Brandon Joseph projecting forward. And and so I think I would factor in all those parts of it. Is is I think that this group is going to be better than a lot of people think it's going to be. I'm not saying it's going to be elite. But I think it's going to be better than people think. And I, I, but I'm more confident in the receiving core, assuming every uh, health is good in, in being better. Just because, again, love Cam Hart, love Brandon Joseph. Mm -hmm. Michael Mayer is still the best player, uh, I think, probably on their football team. That's fair. And that, and that factor, because again, we're talking, we're throwing tight ends. We have to throw tight ends with that, in my opinion. Would you agree with that? When you say wide yeah. receiver group, I think you have to throw Michael Mayer into that conversation. I agree. Brandon Plensner says, does Notre Dame take a three-man cornerback class of Bell, Gray, and Wagner, or does it depend on Caleb Downs' decision? I mean, yes, it depends a little bit on yeah. Caleb Downs. It also depends at numbers at other positions, too, like yeah. defensive line getting to five, yeah. offensive line going to six, potentially. Like it, The numbers matter, Brandon. I, I would say that I think Notre Dame would be fine with two. I think if yeah. they got a... Micah Bell and a Christian Gray, I think they would be content with it, but it depends really where other positions shake out if they're if they're going to take a guy like a Josiah Wagner. I just feel like if those other two kids commit first, I don't think they would push for it. It's just my opinion. I'm not telling you what Notre Dame has told me. I'm just giving you my opinion on the numbers. I don't see how you could take a third corner. Mm -hmm. I don't see because the whole part part of taking Micah Tease as a potential third group among that was that he could play another position. And really, so could Micah Bell. I mean, if, if we're being honest about it, 
but there's less of a need for what he does than than Micah Tease. So now that Micah Tease is a receiver, I think that's where the third corner conversation came from. I don't think mm-hmm. there's a need for a third cornerback this year just for corners. It would have to be a kid who's just too good to pass up. And this is, again, this is my opinion, not Notre Dame's opinion. I don't know what their opinion is. I have not talked to anybody around Notre Dame about Josiah Wagner, my opinion. He's a good football player, Ryan, but he's not the kind of kid you're like, you just got to take that kid. You can't say no to him. Right. I I could find myself potentially saying no to him. You may disagree because I know you've studied his film a lot more than I have, Ryan. No, no, I I don't disagree because, again, it's if, if, I wouldn't sacrifice another spot for like a six offensive lineman potentially or Samuel and Pemba as a DN rover, or however you want to phrase him or Jason Moore. Like I wouldn't sacrifice those players for Josiah Wagner. I do like Josiah Wagner. And if the numbers shake out where he can be there, then sure. But like you said, if, if you're in the perfect class, ideal class and you have Micah Tease, you have some insurance for the cornerback position. You talk to Jeremiah Love, which I just did earlier. He thinks that he could play corner too. I know we have a difference of opinion on that, but there there are other options on on the uh, in the recruiting class other than taking a third. We have a difference of opinion of him being able to play corner. Yeah, yeah, because yeah. I mean, we were talking. We were like, yeah, he could yeah. probably play safety, but corner. Eh, yeah, I don't know about that. But yeah, yeah. I yeah. yeah, I thought you meant like you and I had a difference of opinion. I was like, I don't remember. Us no, 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 no. We don't have a difference of opinion to that. We yeah, have a difference he's... of opinion of him of what he thinks of what he thinks. Okay. Yes, yes, okay. yes. But you know what? I like that. I dig kids that have I love it. You know, especially a kid like him who's a pretty competitive kid. You know, it's mm-hmm. kind of like almost like okay, you don't think I can do it? Now I really want to do it. Now I now <laughs> yeah. I want to play corner. Like and that's what I'm going to tell everybody that I want to play because I want to go prove you wrong. Uh, so we we shall see. We shall see. All right, last few here, uh, James. Z- okay, here's a good one for you. this is for you, Ryan. James Lawrence yep. Zenzi. I got a question. Who do you draft first, Stroud or Young? We I actually did this in a podcast a few weeks ago. I would take Bryce Young, I think, right now. Right this second, we have a whole season to figure this one out. I There's just more of a natural ability as a pure quarterback for Young, in my opinion. I think Stroud, you could argue, has a higher upside because of the size. And even though I don't think the arm strength is much different, to be honest. But I think there is more of an upside from a pure pocket passer perspective. But there's just a a pocket feel perspective for young and accuracy perspective for young. There's just something different about it, in my opinion. So I, I would, I would defer to Bryce young right now. Can I get it? Can I, am I allowed to give a draft Absolutely. opinion on this? Okay. Absolutely. I would actually go a Stroud. Okay. I think right now, Bryce young is definitely a more advanced player than CJ Stroud. Like he, like we've mm-hmm. said this, he's one of the smartest young quarterbacks I've ever seen. Like his feel sure. for the game is exceptional. Like that kid has an incredible high football IQ. I think the, I think the, the problem for me is size and, and it's not the height. I don't care about height. He's a skinny kid. And Agreed. I really worry about like Russell Wilson's short, but Russell's a stocky. I mean, he was a, you know, baseball player kind of, you know, that thick lower body. Kyler Murray's thick. Kyler too. Murray's yep. a thick kid, also a baseball mm-hmm. player. Bryce is real skinny. Like he's not a real big guy. And I really worry about him going through a 17 game season in the national football league. Cause you know, does he have the frame to get a lot bigger? That's a big concern that I have, Ryan. And I don't know what his measurables were in that list that you sent me. They didn't have them on there. They don't usually, they don't usually measure. They don't measure many juniors. typically. Yeah. I just, whereas like CJ Stroud has, he needs a lot more work for Mm -hmm. me. It's kind of like taking Zach Wilson. Or a Trey Lance, you know, you're betting on the the intangibles, but I would argue that C.J. Stroud is already a more proven passer than Zach Wilson and Trey Lance ever were in college. Uh, neither of them are very like mobile guys; they're not runners. But C.J.'s got the bigger body; he's got more of the prototype body. And again, I'm not talking about height. I don't care as much about height in today's game. But I just I think he's and he's still young. If you look at CJ Stroud, he looks young. Like his body's going to keep filling out. And he's going to get thicker and stronger. I wish that CJ would stay for another year. I know that's not, you know, barring an injury, that's not likely in today's era. There's too much money. But as far as him just developing for long term sustainability, I still think waiting another he would need another year. Bryce Young, you could argue, needs all his eligibility just to fill out, but that's just not the era we live in anymore. Sadly, uh, I think both could benefit greatly from senior seasons, but if I'm, cause like you're, you're betting on neither of them are sure things because of different aspects of it. They're not Trevor Lawrence, 
I'm right. taking the guy that has the higher ceiling and the better frame to, to, to right. hold up. That's where I would go with it. But if you, it, it, but it's all, I'm also not going to say that Bryce Young would be a wrong pick because of everything that you said about the kid. I don't disagree with anything you said about him at all. Mm-hmm. He's the best quarterback, but he's the is he the better prospect? That's it's fair. That's my question. It's a fair right. question. Yep. But if I, I can take any quarterback in the country to lead a football team in 2022. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm outside of Tyler Buckner, because I'm always going to pick the guy that I have. But if right. I didn't have him and all my other quarters are gone, I'm, I'm taking Bryce Young. Well, in, in um, just some general feedback, I don't think there's a right or a wrong answer to it because that remember those that grades I sent you, they had the same exact grade. So I, I think that the NFL is going to be very split on the question as well. Yeah. I, yeah. I, and I can get that. And and the, the intangibles for Bryce Young are going to be hard to say no to, but I'm just really worried about the size. It's really fair. worried about the size. And this is coming from someone who's never seen the kid up close and personal, right? So, I mean, that's why we're just having this conversation here and I'm not making the decision in a, in a NFL team's room because then I would be able to see him and size him up and do all that kind of stuff. All right. 99 problems became one. We kind of addressed this earlier. Is the lack of 2023 quarterback commit hurting wide receiver recruiting in 2023 because it causing a pause, at least in certain prospects? And can CJ Carr help with that, assuming it, it's impacting things? I I mean, yeah, I mean, yeah, a, a little bit. I mean, it's it's I, I would say stalling 99 problems. Like it's it's not something where I think it's like completely killing wide receiver recruiting because I think we're still very confident where Notre Dame is with several players. But it's just the fact of if there was a a substantial quarterback in the class, a Dante Moore, then it would be a lot easier to sell. There's no doubt about that. Would this be a fair statement, Ryan? And, mm-hmm. I, and I'm and I'm asking you because you I have never talked to Jane Greathouse. That's what you do. Yep. I evaluate the film and until I hear. So I'm just going to ask you from talking to Jaden Greathouse. Dante Moore's committed to Notre Dame right now, or another top 50 quarterback is committed right now. Is there any doubt in your mind that Jaden Greathouse is going to be done this summer and Notre Dame would be the pick? Yeah, probably. Yeah, I, I wouldn't have much doubt. I mean, I know Jaden says that he wants to see. And again, this is speculation. But my point my is having yeah. that elite quarterback yeah. eases the concern you have about what the offense is going to look like. That's and that, that's, a, that's exactly where I was going to go with it is I'm the sorry. fact that I, I know the premise. No, no, you're fine. I, I know the premise from Jaden is I want to see the on field production type of thing. And when you think about that, you're thinking, what do the wide receivers look like? What are the concepts? Like all that type of stuff. But I think part of that is to your point is you want to see what kind of hands is this quarterback room in long term. And if you had a Dante Moore in the class, for instance, I think you feel a little differently about that. So I agree with you. Same page. I knew that. I was trying to find the button and it wasn't clicking. That's why I stopped. I hate I hate when that happens, man. I hate when that yeah, happens. I noticed you and Vince both muted yourselves yesterday. So yep. blame mm-hmm. me. Always, oh, always my fault. It wasn't my fault yesterday. <laughs> I got to get a big kick out of that yesterday <laughs> when I was editing the show. 99, you guys did a great job yesterday, by the way. Appreciate um, it. Thank you for uh, covering for me. How mm-hmm. do Ronan 99 props BK1? How do Ronan and Braylon James compare? I ask because I think Braylon has a crazy high ceiling and Ronan tends to be spoken about in terms of being an overall athlete. So for me, I, I do think that Braylon has a higher upside. And the reason I think this is that I think I think Ronan is incredibly straight line fast. He's got a massive frame. He's your true boundary wide receiver, right? Like he can take the top off the defense. He's physical. He can, I think that he, you know, as he develops, I think he'll be able to work against press and use his physicality in those regards. Braylon James for me can be your boundary receiver, he could play the field because I think he's a more flexible athlete. Flexibility is kind of the separator for me. I think that he can run routes long-term a little better than Ronan. I think Ronan's more of a vertical-based receiver, while I think Braylon James could be a three-level separator in a variety of ways. I don't think he just has to separate with speed. I think he eventually he'll be able to separate with route running and flexibility as well. I have some film. I, I agree with everything you just said about Ronan Hannafin based on the film that I know you've seen. I've got some film that I'm going to send you when the show's over uh, that I Uh-oh. think you'll, I think you'll change your mind okay. uh, on that. So, uh, cause I had, I, yeah, when I, well, yeah, I'll send it to you when we're done, but I, I think they both have incredibly high ceiling. I gave them both five. They basically graded out almost identical to me. Mm-hmm. Uh, th- whereas I gave them both uh, top hundred grades and five star upside grades. Uh, I think they're both exceptional. I think Ryan's point is spot on in that they're very different players, mm-hmm. very different players. And that's a good thing. You know, because I think with Ronan, 
I view him, if they both reach their potential, I see Ronan as more of a volume guy, like a, like, you know, he can stretch the field, but he'll be a guy that, that is going to be doing back shoulders and, you know, eight, nine catches a game, right? Like a right. much better version of CJ Williams, because I think he's a much better athlete than what CJ Williams was. Uh, CJ is way more polished at the same age than Ronan is, but like, you know what I mean? Like, Mm-hmm. He's six. I mean, we saw a picture. You and I saw the same pictures of him and Braylon next to each other. And like Ronan's noticeably thicker and even a little taller than Braylon is. And, and so he's like that, that volume guy, you know, 80 catches for 1300 yards where Braylon strikes me as that guy that's going to catch like 60 balls for 1200 yards. Right. You know what I mean? Like just, and that's what I love about that combination of the two is they're very complimentary. And, and Braylon's the kind of guy that doesn't need nine catches to get to 120 yards. Mm-hmm. He can do it on four or five. Ronan may get to 130 yards, but get it on nine. Now, again, that doesn't mean he can't be a big play weapon because Ronan's a lot faster than people think. It's more of a style of play. I think Ronan is eventually going to be a really good route runner. He's super raw right now. Mm-hmm. Uh, but that's even more reason why I think he's because he's so big and strong. Like he's going to be a third down monster. Uh, you know, it, it, it's, it's, it's really going to be an, an, an impressive part of what they're doing. And so, um, you know, it's, uh, I saw that Ryan, sorry. Yeah, no, I, I just <laughs> called my that one. Sorry. Ridiculous. Yeah. Oh, you should not. Um, you should not. Yeah. yeah. Uh, but it, it's, it's just different types of players. And so when you ask like, who's got the higher ceiling, it would, my answer, my long, you know, to make a long, short story long it would be kind of what are you looking for, right? Like what part of the – what type of receiver are you looking for? If you're looking for a, a home run hitter with size and speed and all that, then I'm, I want Braylon. I think if you're looking for the all-around receiver, I think that's where Ronan's game is going to be. Both of them have the ability to do both. I think Ronan could, could be – is also a guy that's going to be a big play weapon. I don't think people appreciate how athletic Ronan Hannafin is. I really they don't. don't. They I don't. don't. I really don't. And, and and he's a really really elite athlete, and now they're they're going to compare him to every every other white receiver, low in tall white receiver. Right. So your Eric Deckers of the world, right. they're going to compare them to those guys when this kid's a four four athlete. Like it's just no a doubt. different player, different no player. doubt. You're hundred mm-hmm. percent correct. And then Braylon's an explosive guy as well, and and so I I love that duo. And then there's Jaden Greathouse, who is sort of like a. He is C.J. Williams. I mean, he's a bigger version of C.J. Williams from last year. Mm-hmm. You know, I mean, that's the better comparison. And, and I think C.J.'s got a little bit more athletic potential, but Jaden's a better player right now. And that's saying a lot because C.J. was a really good football player last year. Yeah. Uh, and I think C.J. has more room to physically grow and develop. But, you know, Jaden's – Jaden's. I mean, he is that player. And so that would make for a very interesting trio. But I, I, I think you would agree with this. Ronan and Braylon have higher ceilings than Jaden Greathouse, even. I don't disagree. Yeah. I don't disagree. No. Jay, but but I would say this: Ronan's the guy, or Jaden's the guy. I'm most confident in. Like I know he's going to pan out. Like barring yeah. injury, Jaden Greathouse is going to pan out. He's going to be a good football player for sure. It's just you know what's this? And now if he's more athletic than I think he is, then this conversation changes. Yeah, because his feel for the game is except. I mean, his, his feel for how to play wide receiver is elite. Okay. My only question about Jaden is, I, and he's got a great great body. Like six mm-hmm. two two ten. My only question about Jaden is speed and overall athleticism. If I'm wrong about that, then he's going to be an elite player. Agree, because this game is is exceptional. It, it, we're talking about the projection at this point in time. Yep. Let's get to the last few here. Uh, here's an interest. A one hundred said something to Antoine Johnson. I look at Florida State and believe they'll turn the corner this season. That reminds me, we are going to also do a sort of like position, like conference predictions this year. And we're going to talk about those, Ryan. And I cannot wait to the comp floor state conversation because they are such an enigma this year. Yeah. It is going to be a very, very interesting. Um, yeah. Yep. Justin Carlson asks, is the top 20, 2024 safety Woodyard or is he two? I'd say he's number one right now. Um, I mean, I think, I think there's, you're still trying to figure out, you know, where you stand with some guys, you know, to a degree on like the Zaquan Patter, uh, Patterson and those types of guys. But I mean, Woodyard is a 
I mean, he's considered a top 20 player by I think two or three mm-hmm. recruiting platforms already. And he's got the ties to Notre Dame and he's a Cali kid and he's a really talented player. So yeah, mm-hmm. I, I would say he's a top target on, at the safety board for Notre Dame. He's definitely the most known commodity. Yep. That's the thing I would say confidently is he's definitely the most known commodity. Could someone else overcome that? Sure. He's the most known commodity. No question. Last question is actually going to go to our uh, the Ohio State fan who's joined us for our last few shows, Archer452. What's the biggest position priority position for recruiting in 24 to 25? Is that position deep in those classes? Example, I know you've mentioned O-line being much deeper in 23 than 24. I can't go to 25. Like it's super (laughs) early for that. Like super early for that. The only thing I know about 25 is there's a lot of really good young quarterbacks in 25. How will they develop and grow? Don't know. Wait, wait, but but Notre Dame just offered a 26 kid. Oh, we can't jump to 25 already. <laughs> well, one of them I get because it's uh, it's Mosley's kid, right? It's Emmett sure. Mosley and his 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 wife, who's a great soccer player here. Cool, offer them. Yeah, uh, but 24. I'll, I'll compare 24. I think what the, the Sean. So the topic that Sean and I are going to cover on Saturday, Ryan, which is going to be mm-hmm. very interesting, and I'm going to want your opinion on it too after the show. Yeah, is we're going to discuss which recruiting class is more important for Notre Dame to really maximize its program. Which which class has to have be, be to reach its full potential, 23 or 24 for Notre Dame mm-hmm. as a whole. Mm-hmm. So we're going to kind of dive into those. So I think but I think the one thing that we that we will say is the 24 three class is going to be bigger in numbers, most likely. Yep. And I think the 24 class is going to be more targeted with individual players. Sure. Archer, I would say that the biggest the biggest priority position for recruiting in those classes is going to be quarterback because of where things are with Dante Moore and the fact that they don't have a quarterback. So I think they've kind of already hit that position that they really needed success at is 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 there. I think yep. after that, I would I would say that the next the next position where they're the next most important position for Notre Dame in 2024, I would say is receiver. Yeah. I, I would still say I think they need a second strong year in a row of just really impact players are receiving now the difference is next year they won't need the numbers that they needed this year right they can only get three receivers next year to be okay because you'll have four this year maybe five mm-hmm. you'll have three next year plus you have to buy some Merriweather. maybe I mean, that's like that's nine right there right I and mean, maybe get to a fourth or maybe bring in a grad transfer for depth and you know you still have Jaden thomas is going to be a red shirt freshman dion's a red shirt fre- no dion played more than four games last year or did he only play four last year i think Not he played sure more than that. four correct I'm not uh, sure, but I'll, I'll go look here. Uh, that's one thing that Pro Football Focus is actually decent in, as I said, data collection. So they'll be able to tell us how much you played. The point is, numbers won't be as much of a problem in 24 if you get at least four this year. If you get five, you're in great shape. I still think that there is a, a another a, a getting dynamic with the ball playmakers at receiver. I guess that's a I'll, I'll narrow it down even more defined mm-hmm. for me quarterback and then landing more playmakers with the ball in their hands at receiver to me were the two that I think were are, are most important. Uh, you do that, then Dion played 12 games last year. So he's, he's burned a year. He played in 12 is, games. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. Wow. That's what they have him down as. Yeah. Huh. And now that, yeah, now that I think about it, it make it makes sense. So Ryan, that's where, I, that's where I would probably say, I think, I mean, overall it's just landing impact players, but I think receiver is still going to be in a year where there's going to be a need for numbers. Right. It's going to be another. I mean, linebacker is going to be small class targeted. D line class doesn't have to be huge. It's going to be targeted on top players. O line class is going to be now nah, because I think corner to me, it's like for me, look, it'd be great to get five star corners and elite like step in day one corners. But I've always felt if you give me a Benjamin Morrison and a Jade Mickey and then every a year, year later, Christian Gray and Micah Bell every year, that kind of yeah. duo, you're going to be fine because look, Notre Dame's already shown that. I mean, they had one of the best cornerback tandems in the country in 2018 and Julian Love and Troy Pride. Neither one of them were elite, you know, prospects, not even close. And they weren't elite draft prospects either. They were both fourth round picks. But man, they were one heck of a corner tandem. If you coach them well and they're they have skill set. And that's the thing I love about these corner duos. You asked me yesterday, one of the questions Ryan asked me, and I had to think about it. And you, you all know me. Like I don't get silent very often. And I had to sit and think about this one for a minute. Mm-hmm. And he asked me, who do you think has more upside? Benjamin Morrison, who you all know I love, or Micah Bell? And I literally sat in silence. And I think I probably talk in my sleep. I mean, that's, that's what I do, right? Uh, 
But it's not think about it. And I kind of went back and forth on it a little bit. And and so the, the point being, like, I, I, I love, and as we got in the conversation, I love the diversity of the a potential cornerback group that Notre Dame could get if they're able to get Gray and Bell. Because you've got, like, the really fundamentally sound, tough, athletic kid like Jaden Mickey, who's completely different. Benjamin Morrison's like six foot, six one, long arms, physical, can run. He's more of like that boundary guy. Christian Gray is kind of similar. He's kind of a little bit of a mix of Jaden Mickey and Benjamin Morrison. He's got like a little bit of both of them in him, you know, where he could play both outside spots, maybe even some nickel in certain situations, but definitely both outside spots. And then there's Micah Bell, who's like the prototype field corner, just elite speed. I mean, just game-changing speed as a corner. They're very different. They complement each other extremely well. And, and you know, to me, Ryan's like, give me another class like that and I'm good. Mm-hmm. And, and you know, so it's important to do that. And I think to your point, that's probably the most important position for me. I'd still argue safety. And the reason I say that is, is because I love the safety class, even if they get Caleb Downs, you know, but, but again, we said, I don't, I don't see Notre Dame getting Caleb Downs. I just, I have a hard time with that. Uh, for me, it would be, even if you get Peyton Bona, Don Schuler, you didn't sign a single safety the class before. Right. The year before that, all your safeties are guys that moved from other positions, <laughs> right? Like you just, your safety depth chart is still a little like if Peyton Bowen and Don Schuler don't pan out or get hurt or something, your safety position is a mess. So I would say safety is probably still most important because you need a second, you need to counter, you need to complement this year's great safety class with another one. So that would probably be my most important position on, on, uh, I'll ask this. If Notre Dame gets Mike Bell and Christian Gray, mm-hmm. you and I would probably look back at the last two years and say the best defensive back prospect they would have signed is probably Peyton Bowen, right? Yes. Yeah. So you look at the two classes, so 22 and 23, which overall is in the best spot, corner or safety? Because I'd argue corner. Yeah, that's fair. That's fair. You yeah. only got two pure safeties. That's it. Yeah, and you're losing a lot. You're losing a couple safeties after the 2022 season. Right. So yeah, I get that. My my immediate one was wide receiver. You hit on that one. I think you know we're Notre Dame is still dealing with depth issues, and even if they take four or five, you're still talking about you know Joe Wilkins being gone, Avery Davis, and Braden Lindsey, and there's going to be attrition to that position as well. So I, I would say wide receiver is the main one for me. I think offensive line is going to be a smaller class in 2024. Defensive line is going to be a smaller class in 2024. Linebackers is going to be a smaller class in 2024. You already have the quarterback in CJ Carr. So, yeah, I would say wide receiver is probably the paramount position for them. So that's going to do it, Ryan. So why don't you go ahead and uh, why don't you go ahead and take us out of here, man? Let's do it. So appreciate everyone again for joining us. No Mace AK for the final yeah. shout out of the day. You have to check on we, him. I know. You we do need to check on him. questions either. I'm at the couple people I'm going to check on today, man. I know they are, they're always, they're the uh, OGs in the chat. So definitely need to check on everybody. Hope everybody out there is doing well. We appreciate you for joining us today on today's show. Please, before you leave, make sure you like, make sure you subscribe, make sure you hit the notification bell for any important podcast that they can pop up anytime and make sure you share the podcast. Five-star reviews are always very much appreciated from Brian. I am Ryan. Thank you so much again today for joining the Irish Breakdown Podcast.